everybody, ladies, gentlemen, uh, welcome. Uh, we are here together tonight because Marcus Gabriel will give a lecture on why the world does not exist. Uh, yes. Uh, Marcus Gabriel is a professor of theory of cognition at the University of Bonn. When he was appointed as professor in 2009, he was the youngest ever in Germany. Um, I don't know what that really means, but it's a, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about the world and how uh, that does not exist and, uh, and unicorns do. Interesting. Um, he will give a lecture first and afterwards, Case Leinhorst, uh, assistant professor of history of philosophy at this university, uh, will do a short interview and there will be plen plenty of time for questions from you, the audience. Um, let's keep it brief. Uh, a round of applause for Marcus Gabriel. Yeah, first of all, oh, is this okay? Am I too loud? Okay, good. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much uh, uh, for having me tonight. Um, uh, as promised, I will talk about why the world does not exist. Um, and uh, I will basically, I will run you through the outlines of the basic arguments. Um, there are further things entailed by this, and then, you know, there's a, there's a bigger framework than what I'm going to present today, but I'm running you through some of the uh, uh, philosophical, um, um, very important uh, elements of the argument. So, uh, in particular, I will talk about the world. I will start with the world, and then, that was not me, so there's no PowerPoint. Uh, whatever happens over there is, uh, bears no, no intended relation to what's going on here. No. Where, where, if you ask my intent, whatever they intend, okay, so. Okay, good. Huh. So, I will start, with, I will say a few things about the world in a second, but maybe now I will start with existence. Uh, so I sometimes start with the world and sometimes with, with existence, and I usually do not talk about not, uh, and uh, the why is uh, the set of reasons that I'm giving you. So, why the world does not exist, let's start with exists. Um, Okay, yeah, now I'm back. <clears throat> so, what do we mean when we ascribe existence to something? So, let me, let me define a few terms. Um, by ontology, a big word, I mean the systematic investigation into the meaning of existence, if any. Okay, so, if the word existence has a unified meaning, which I think it has, then ontology is interested in the meaning of existence. So, it's not an analysis of language, uh, ontology is not uh, somehow a part uh, of the uh, a branch of the philosophy of language, uh, we directly talk about the meaning of existence by understanding what existence means. This is what ontology is, in my view. And then there are you know, all sorts of arguments uh, turning around the question of existence. I don't think that being uh, plays any role in ontology. So ontology, is, in my view, is not about being at all, I don't think that there's a meaningful question about being to be asked. I think being is a very confused uh, and confusing term, which is why I will just talk about existence here. And I think that's what ontology is about. I contrast ontology with metaphysics. And uh, what do I mean by metaphysics? I mean, again, you might all mean all sorts of things by the word metaphysics, but here's the relevant contrast. Metaphysics uh, uh, in, this, in this context means a theory of totality. So metaphysics is a theory about absolutely everything. So if you do metaphysics, I mean, that is the age-old idea behind metaphysics. If you look at Plato and Aristotle, they will tell you that they can know everything, panta epistastai, by knowing its principles. So there the idea is exactly that, that metaphysics is a theory of totality, a theory of absolutely everything. And most philosophers have believed for millennia that uh, the, the meaning of existence and uh, the meaning of absolutely everything not only hang together, but that it's the same question. Okay, so if you want to know what it is for something to exist, then you are on some level or other committed to saying something about absolutely everything. Okay, and this is still with us today. Uh, uh, metaphysics has not died out, uh, despite many attempts at killing it in the last century. Metaphysics is as prominent as ever. We live in, uh, be it in academic philosophy or uh, in our general worldview, we live in a metaphysical age, 
And it's metaphysical precisely because we have beliefs about absolutely everything, uh, uh, in a quite literal sense. Um, and uh, I will argue that that's misguided. So ontology is fine, metaphysics is bad. Okay, so uh, there might be, again, you can uh, attach different meanings to the word metaphysics. You can say metaphysics is something like drawing a principal distinction between appearance and being, or appearance and reality. Metaphysics is what goes beyond physics. You, you name it. But what I'm attacking is uh, metaphysics in the sense of a theory of totality, which I also call a theory of the world as world. Okay, so that would be metaphysics, and I'm not doing that. And I'm giving arguments for why no one should do that. Okay, so uh, it's, uh, 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 I call this view also in, in my more technical moments, the, why the world does not exist. I call the view that the world does not exist also meta-metaphysical nihilism. But that is just for philosophers, you know, like that's just a, a big word so that... Uh, my colleagues at the universities also uh, respect uh, my view. Uh, so I <laughs> have different words for it. Uh, but it's the same view. I also call it the no world view. So uh, what is existence then? So let me give you a number of examples of things that I think obviously exist. Uh, the past, uh, the future, my hands, galaxies, up quarks, uh, toilets, um, uh, pubic hair, uh, um, the public sphere, governments, and the number three. Uh, but this is just a random list of things that exist, in my view, uh, and I will add moral values, but that doesn't really matter in this particular context, and it's harder uh, to say what I mean there. So the other things I take to be obvious. Um, but now you might wonder, but, ha, but how can all these things exist? And if this uh, looks like a problem to you, then maybe it looks like a problem uh, to you because you're expecting that all the things on my list should somehow coexist. You don't only want them to exist, you want them to coexist. Uh, and, here, and let me tell you why you want that. Okay? Uh, I know your mind better than you do. Uh, um, here's why I think you would want to do that. Uh, because you might think that some version of the following argument okay, has a hold on you. Here's the argument. And it's actually good until a certain step and then it gets bad. And I will show you where it's bad. So here's, uh, uh, here's, let's start there. So imagine uh, there's a particular object O, let's call it O1. And uh, uh, I tell you to find O1 for me. And now you ask me, okay, I'm, I'm going to help you, give me uh, to find O1. What can you tell me about O1 so that I can find it? And now imagine I give you exactly one piece of information and it's the only piece of information I have, O1 exists. And now you start looking for the existing object. Well, good luck trying. Uh, uh, why, why is it so bad, it's so hard to find the existing object? Well, because wherever you look, you will find existing objects. You can't look for an object that doesn't exist among the objects that exist. So uh, knowing, only knowing about something that it exists means having no information as to how to find it, as to how to individuate it, to put it slightly more technically. Uh, and I think that is an age-old idea, you know, Kant has put it like this, Existence is not a real predicate. Uh, Hegel has said, being and nothing are one and the same. You know, and I think uh, uh, Frege says, uh, existence is a second level property. Whatever, there are many names for the view. But the view is that um, if, uh, if you only know that something exists, I think this, it boils down to that, then you have no, uh, uh, then you have thereby not gained any discriminatory capacity. You cannot distinguish something from something else only by knowing that it exists. Okay. Uh, well, and that contrasts with uh, knowing that something's green, for instance. Of course, there are many green things. And it will not be very helpful if I tell you, lo uh, look for the green thing, give me the green thing, because there are many green things. But nevertheless, uh, um, the predicate is green, or the property of being green, distinguishes green things from other things. Okay, so the, the property of existence does not distinguish some objects from other objects. So let me b give you a definition, and let's say that a proper property is a property, a reference to which puts you in a position to distinguish an object in the world from another object. That's a default definition. So that's, let's call this a proper property, because this is what properties are good for. They distinguish things from other things, or objects from other objects, in a not so technical sense of the term. So that's kind of easy, I think, to understand. Now, existence is not a proper property. Uh, um, that is the starting point. And I do think that uh, hardly anyone, maybe no one, has ever believed in the history of philosophy that existence is a proper property. Many, and so do I, believe that existence is a property, but I don't think that anyone believes that existence is a proper property. Uh, um, uh, those are two different views. Now, 
what is existence then if it's not a proper property? And let's say that here is what most people believe, I think. To exist means to be part of the world. You know, like if something exists, it's part of the world. This looks very natural, okay? as a, maybe even as a definition of existence. But if that's your definition of existence, if you understand uh, existence as being part of the world, whatever exists is part of the world, you will notice that you are now not describing an object as existent, but you are predicating something of the world. You're saying that if something exists, then this means that the world contains it. You're speaking about the world now and not about the object. So to say that I exist means to say that I am part of the world. The world has the property of containing me. Okay, that is the sense in which you go second order. You go one level up. Okay, you go from the object to the world. You go from a content to a frame. Or to speak a little bit of my language, you go from an object to a field. Uh, uh, and Kant, for instance, has therefore defined, that's a quote from uh, Kant's critique of pure reason, the world as the field of possible experience. So this is where you already find the Feldmögliche Erfahrung. It's this metaphor. You already find the field metaphor there. Okay, good. So much for that. But here's a problem. What about the world itself? So if to exist means to be part of the world, and to, if to be part of the world involves having proper properties, such that whatever is part of the world differs from other things that are part of the world, then the world can trivially not be part of the world. Okay, because uh, 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 by that definition, the world is not an object within the world. By that definition of what it is to be contained by the world. But if your only concept of existence is to be part of the world, then you have to say that the world does not exist. Okay, you don't even need me for that. You're already committed to that. And this is driving modern philosophy. Kant is saying that, Habermas is saying that, Heidegger is saying that, and many other evil Germans are saying that. And uh, they are saying that... Uh, uh, um, uh, the world should exist, but it doesn't. Otherwise put, their theories are contradictory. But it doesn't come out because they're cheating. Let me give you a sense for how they're cheating. Kant says, it's really clear if you read uh, the critique of pure reason, and uh, he explicitly says the following, the world does not exist, because by existence he means whatever appears within the world. Okay, Existence is only predicable of what appears within the world according to Kant. So the world can't exist because the predicate of existence can never apply to it by the set of reasonings that I've given you, the set of reasons. So Kant buys all of this. And then he says, but that would be bad. Because if the world does not exist, then nothing exists. Because the world is the only place where something could exist. But if the world doesn't exist, then nothing exists. So Kant really believes that nothing exists. Uh, 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 the philosopher Jacobi already said, Kant is a nihilist. And he meant something else. But I think uh, Kant is really way more of a nihilist than could, you could imagine. Okay. He's more nihilistic than the, 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 the most radical uh, Indian monk. Okay? So nothing exists. This is what Kant has to believe. But of course, he, he finds a way of cheating. Here's what he does. He says, the world does not exist, but maybe it schmixists. Okay? Schmixistence would be whatever it is for the world that the world is doing so that it does kind of exist. Okay? Uh, let me give you another example of the world does not exist, but it schmixists. Heidegger. The world does not exist, it whirls. Okay, so it's the same form of thinking. It doesn't exist, but it whirls. That's cheating. Uh, and here's Habermas's version, same idea. The world does not exist, it's a regulative idea. Okay, so, but if it doesn't exist, it can't be a regulative idea. You know, imagine, imagine I tell you, here's a regulative idea. Here's something that guides your entire cognitive life, science. Okay, look for the round square. And then you can say, how can I look for the round square? It's an impossible object. It can't drive my activity, it's impossible. And the, uh, so you can't say the world does not exist, but it's a regulative idea. That's cheating again. So that is a very widespread move in modern philosophy. Okay, so uh, um, uh, it happens all the time. So what did I do? This is how I ca uh, came up with that idea. So I thought that, okay, so why is this a problem? So if existence is not a proper property, but a property of the, uh, some kind of higher order, whatever it is, I will say something about this. Okay, if that's what existence is, then we only need to get rid of the assumption that there can only be one domain, which then has to be part of itself in order to exist. That doesn't also, you, you can just uh, set theoretic arguments in order to destroy that. There are all sorts of other reasons uh, uh, um, that I can go into in discussion, if you like. Um, so that world's gone. Why not just drop the monistic assumption, the idea that there is only one world which settles questions of existence? 
okay? Now, just go plural. And, uh, uh, and the, pro the logical problem is solved. You don't have the problem anymore. What you have to say is, the world does not exist. It never existed, it will never exist. It's not a, a regulative idea, it doesn't world, it doesn't exist, it doesn't do anything, okay? So you just have to drop the world. That's the basic idea of the book, okay? Uh, 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 and uh, this is part of the theoretical motivation. Now you might say, well, isn't that postmodernism? Or uh, that sounds like something philosophers like Richard Rorty or Nelson Goodman maybe would have said to, to just drop a few names. That sounds familiar. Maybe Heidegger said something like that in some moment of his. So, or Husserl, or whatever, name it. So this something, it somehow sounds familiar, okay? Once you get the idea, it sounds familiar. But what all these people have said, you can figure out why I differ uh, uh, by just answering the following questions. Would these philosophers have said something like the following? Um, the moon would have been smaller than the earth had no one been around to notice it. Okay? And, uh, or the number three would have existed, would have been the only num natural number between the number two and the number four had no one ever had the concept of numbers. And you will, you will soon see that most of the philosophers that sound pluralistic and like they have given up on the world will not be realists about the plurality of domains. They will think that, yes, there is some kind of uh, plurality of fields, you know, but the plurality of fields only exists because we have manifold language games. So the idea will be something like, yes, art and science and religion differ, but not because art and science and religion are different, but because we treat them differently. So the difference between art and science is kind of conventional. You know, this is how we roll. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, I think Rorty uh, you know, uh, would be saying things like that. Uh, I deny all of that because I do not think that the analysis of the meaning of existence is something like the analysis of human conventions or human language. I don't think that, uh, I think it's just thinking. So I don't think that language stands in our way to pure thinking. I, uh, so I, th I think a lot of this was really misguided arguments of this form. Uh, um, and they were only there in order to b believe both that the world does not exist and that there's a plurality of domains without committing to the idea that really there is a plurality of domains. Okay, what, what postmodernism in my sense of the term was saying is that, well, there's a plurality of domains, but only because we make it true that there's such a plurality. And I think there would have been such a plurality regardless of what we think we are making true or not. So that's, uh, that's why I'm both, now you can understand this, an ontological realist in that I believe that what I'm talking about is perfectly independent of the existence of a human mind. It would have been the case had there been no minds. I'm not saying there are no minds or that minds are not important or subjects or subjectivity or consciousness or intentionality. I'm saying that uh, the existence of uh, this particular set of phenomena is, uh, is uh, um, largely insignificant. It's very important for us uh, because we wouldn't be around, you know, like had we no minds, we wouldn't be around. Surprise, surprise. But it, uh, uh, this doesn't have any ontological implications, I believe. Okay. Uh, um, you only think that it should have ontological implications because you're still a metaphysician. You still want to figure out how, say, ni nature and mind relate to each other. But that is because there's the idea that there should be a domain of absolutely everything, and that domain should be coherent. And then you get, into, then you get problems of the familiar sort. How can something both be an electromagnetic wave with a certain frequency and a color? Now you have to figure that out. I don't have to figure that out in my onto on, uh, ontology. I have to say something about this, but not in the ontology, because I can just say, well, there are two fields, the field of colors and the field of electromagnetic waves. There are relations between the two fields, but I, for instance, don't think that the relation between the two fields is causal. I think it's nonsense to believe that electromagnetic wave cause colors into existence. Uh, there are all sorts of mistakes one can make there. It's a difficult issue. But I'm just uh, uh, um, hinting at certain things. So, the world really does not exist uh, um, in no form. Not, is it, not only does it not exist as an object, okay, a big thing, the biggest thing that encompasses everything, the cosmos or the universe, it also does not exist in the form of a thought that encompasses everything or in the form of a principle that determines everything. Okay? So uh, 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 not, uh, you cannot save the world on any construal. It just does not exist. 
So uh, many philosophers have tried to uh, read my claim as me being committed to the Habermasian thesis where, oh yeah, Gabriel is just saying the world is not an object. He's saying it's a presupposition of discourse or something like that. No, I'm saying it doesn't, uh, it doesn't exist. I, uh, this is not Kantianism, okay? Uh, um, the, even though there's, uh, you know, I can tell you where I think Kant says relevant things for ontology, um, but it's not about Kant here. So it's a, it's a very different claim. So what does follow from this? I think all sorts of things follow, but uh, uh, let, me, let me give you a different feeling for where this is going. Uh, uh, the example with which I opened the book, the Vesuvius example. So uh, here's the Vesuvius example. So imagine uh, we are in Naples now, and there's this volcano called Vesuvius, and uh, we look at the volcano. And another group of friends is on the other side of the bay, they're in Sorrento, and they're also looking at the volcano. Now, uh, uh, there are at the very least three stands you can take on the situation. Here are the three. The first I call old realism. What does old realism say? Old realism says that in that situation, what's really there is the Mount Vesuvius. Okay, Mount Vesuvius is the reality in that situation. I call that old, uh, old realism. Why? Because it's the idea that in order to be a realist, in order to believe that there's that's already the language of old uh, realism. In order to believe in the existence of a mind-independent reality, you, you have to uh, go for the concrete stuff, okay, for the material objects, you know. Uh, volcanoes are certainly good examples of that. You know. We haven't made that, it's there. Uh, so that would be old realism. But now, where are your perspectives on the mountain? And then you get a problem. The mountain looks like this from here, and it looks like that from over there. So how do I relate the way the thing looks to the thing? Okay, so there must be some relation between the way thing, uh, the, the way the thing looks and the thing. And uh, if you look at realists of the traditional uh, stripe, they will tell you something about how the mountain causes you to see the mountain in a certain way. Okay, but that doesn't help you because I cannot understand uh, uh, the impression of the mountain with its perspectival laws, etc., in terms of causation. That doesn't really work. So what I do in, uh, uh, instead is I accept the independent existence of perspectives. Okay, so perspectives are more objects. It's not only that there's Mount Vesuvius, there's the way Mount Vesuvius looks to me and the way Mount Vesuvius looks to you. And Mount Vesuvius is not, it's, uh, not realer, uh, uh, if this even makes sense uh, to use the comparative here, it's not realer than uh, your perspective on Mount Vesuvius. They're equally real. Okay, that, uh, I call that view new realism. You can sum this up by saying that the idea is um, that our thoughts are not re less real than what they are thoughts about. If I think that it's raining in London, my thought that it's raining in London is not less real than the rain in London. It's just another fact. Okay, uh, uh, so there, uh, thinking is not less real. Uh, um, Yes, thinking is going to get out, you know, we're going to be extinct at some point, whatever. But that doesn't matter for questions of existence, okay? Things are not more or less real uh, depending on how long they exist or whatever. That's, uh, that is not an ontological problem. So, uh, um, instead of speaking about objects then and perspectives, I prefer to speak of a field of sense. That's the terminology there. And I define existence, here's a definition now, as appearance in a field of sense. So, for, if something exists, there's going to be a field of sense within which it appears. What's a field of sense? Well, a field of sense, in order to un understand the idea, let me uh, introduce another allegory, which I call the allegory of the cubes. So, imagine there are three cubes on the table. A blue, a red, and a white cube. And, uh, and you ask uh, an innocent bypasser, as I call the person, so someone not yet affected by philosophical reasoning, so a happy person, you ask a happy person, uh, hey, uh, Hans, how many objects are there? And a very natural answer would be to say three. There are three objects on the table. And Hans will have counted the cubes, most likely. Okay? But now imagine uh, uh, someone who is like, really into uh, particle physics and absolutely obsessed by it passes by and you ask that person, hey, Erwin Schrödinger, say, Erwin, uh, how many objects is there? And then he will come up with a crazy number N, a huge number, and uh, you're shocked. And he says, yeah, of course, uh, the cubes are an illusion. They are really only elementary particles of the form F. And you will get an entire theory of how there are really no cubes, etc. Uh, uh, 
and you're already surprised. But now a third person comes by and he asks, how many objects are there? You're already confused. And the person says, one, obviously. And you're like, what do you mean? Turns out uh, she's an artist and uh, Laura, say, and Laura sees this as a, a, a reflection on the, uh, 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 on the colors in David Lynch. You know, blue, white, and red are very important for David Lynch's movies. He's playing with the American flag there. He's trying to deconstruct the American flag and turn it into the French flag, I would say. But that's uh, my reading of David Lynch. Uh, uh, um, so the, but the artist would count all of this as just one object. It's one object. It's an artwork. Uh, um, so how many objects are there? And now you can say, we will never know. Uh, uh, there are only ways of cutting up the objects. Who knows how many objects there are? And then you're Nelson Goodman. Okay, this is basically what Nelson Goodman says. We can't know, it's a meaningless question, etc. Uh, we have to cut up uh, things, and we can't even say that there's something that we cut up. This causes, and then you get all sorts of difficult problems, and it sounds interesting, but uh, is misguided. Uh, um, so what I would say instead is, um, well, look, objectively there are three objects, and one object, and n objects. It depends on the field of sense, so there's no contradiction. Let me give you another very simple example. I believe that there are witches, but there are no witches in the Netherlands, or in Germany, or in Hungary, or in Spain. Uh, but there are witches in, uh, in the carnival in Cologne. So I see witches all the time. There, uh, uh, depending on how you interpret the movie, there's a witch in the Bla Blair Witch Project. That's contentious. You can read it differently. So let's take Goethe's Faust, there's, or Macbeth. Okay, there are witches in Goethe's Faust. So I, I think that it's not a coincidence that uh, uh, in a lot of languages, our expression for existence is uh, local, locative. Okay, to exist means to stand out. Uh, bestan, uh, bestan, obviously, okay, standing, standing out, it's the standing metaphor in existence. Uh, uh, il y a in French gives you a location there, there it has there. Uh, uh, you find the same in classical Chinese, yo. Modern Chinese is easier, easier. it's as if they used my ontology. They say it's when zai, which means to be contained in. Okay, that's exactly the meaning. But that's a longer story how that got into language via Japan and Heidegger. So that's a direct uh, linguistic influence. Uh, Italian, the same, che, okay, uh, uh, there is, etc., etc. So the idea that there, is a, uh, that there is a location for something's existence, and that's exactly the sense of existence as in there's a number between two and four. You give a, uh, you give a particular location, you can tell someone how to get there. And this needn't be literally an activity of an animal that moves around in four-dimensional space-time. Okay? So uh, I can get to a thought and figure out that it exists. So spatial temporality is not important for existence. Uh, yes, uh, there are spatial temporal objects, and maybe it's hard for us to figure out what their identity criteria are, but that doesn't settle the meaning of existence because they're also non-spatial temporal objects, and they're not at all mysterious. There's nothing mysterious about their existence. They might be mysterious for all sorts of reasons, but not in terms of their existence. Very easy to understand. But you have to give up the idea that there should be an all-encompassing domain, that everything should coexist. That is, uh, that is the misguided idea. Uh, uh, that I argue that we, uh, in the book, and uh, uh, I argue that we need to drop that idea. Um, we need to disentangle ontology from metaphysics so that we can have a new methodological framework in which we conduct philosophical research. Why? Because a lot of philosophical questions in contemporary philosophy assume the existence of the world as a background for the entire activity. Uh, um, you know, such as when people say, how does mind fit into nature? Now they're looking for an all-encompassing thing, it, and they wonder how mind and nature fit into it. Uh, but it's going to be there. So there, there's always going to be a worldview in the background. Often it's implicit. Uh, and tacitly assumed. But that's terrible for philosophy because if your major term that's doing all the, the heavyweight lifting in your theory, okay, uh, turns out to be an empty name that doesn't refer to anything, okay, and that's kind when it comes to the word, uh, the world, I think. It's worse, not just an empty, it's not even an empty name. Uh, uh, if you ask me uh, this quote, you know, what, what would you say, like, uh, the world, about the world? I think the word the world means as much as the following. Uh, nothing. It has no meaning. It's only an illusion. Uh, um, it's interesting how the illusion got there. Let me just hint at that and then I will end and uh, we will move to the interview and Q&A session. I, uh, I think the world was created by, uh, in the so-called axial age, as Karl Jaspers puts it, so by the pre-Socratics and the Chinese philosophers and other people. 
so uh, uh, they created the world. Uh, so, uh, literally, creation myth created the world, uh, if you like. Uh, and what happened was that what Sigmund Freud has famously called our oceanic feeling, the feeling of belonging to something bigger that's already there, that our oceanic, oceanic feeling somehow you know, ran amok. Uh, uh, that's Thales. Okay? When he says everything's water, uh, that's exactly that. Okay? Uh, uh, and, uh, he wants to go back to the uterus okay? when he was still in, in, in tune with things. Everything's water. And uh, 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 um, uh, on that level, okay. So, and that, that, uh, and then uh, Parmenides, who had a more abstract sense for things, he said, "Well, let's not say water. Let's say being. Everything is being." And uh, 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 but it's the same idea. You you draw, as it were, a huge circle around everything, okay, a sphere, as he puts it. And there are all sorts of metaphors for that then in the tradition of philosophy. And you, you have the impression that it settles all your questions. You don't have it yet because, you know, uh, uh, on the way to it, you have to destroy the mortal mistakes that your fellow beings make, but then, it, but it is safe. What I'm saying is that there is no it, okay? That it has to be dropped. It was just a mistake made by, mostly by Parmenides, okay? So this is, this is where things get wrong. And it's a contingent mistake. There's no necessity in it. I don't think that the human being is the metaphysical animal that just has to have worldviews, etc. No destiny, no fate in it. Just a simple mistake. It's like people have been calculating on the basis of 2 plus 2 equals 5. And they've been doing a surprisingly good job, you know, given the fact that they start out with a false proposition. Uh, um, um, but I think it's absolutely time to give that up because it's, uh, it's very harmful in the con uh, for contemporary humanity, I think, to have the idea of a worldview. We, we live in a time in, in which we think, at least, it's, it's perfectly inadequate, but in which we think that there's something like a fight between science and religion for the right worldview. Uh, as if worldviews were fighting right now. So there would be different beliefs about how absolutely everything hangs, to, uh, hangs together, and now we figure, have to figure out which one is the right one. And I think they're all equally false. Okay? But in the book I also argue that uh, neither religion, nor art, nor actual science is a worldview or should have one. Uh, it's, per it's absolutely dispensable. But if we give it up, we will have to look at things quite differently. Uh, the religion versus art versus science versus philosophy versus whatever else you want to have on the list will look quite differently once you give up the idea that there's exactly one domain where everything hangs together. And it's certainly neither the cosmos nor the universe. None of this is relevant on that level of analysis. Uh, and it's absolutely time to give it up. Uh, and I've only presented you some arguments uh, for this. There are more, of course. Uh, this is how philosophy works, and uh, you will have some objections uh, to some things. But uh, the very least uh, uh, that I want to get across is that um, the, the idea that there should be such a thing as absolutely everything, okay, uh, uh, there's so much pressure on that idea that it, it turns out to be untenable. Okay, from a logical point of view, good luck working it out. Okay? Uh, some people have tried. But then, even if you settle that, there will be the entire ontological problem that I've only touched upon today. So I think that uh, the concept of the world is really profoundly hopeless, but it's central. Just look at, uh, at, how, uh, at ph uh, famous philosophy book titles. Mind and world, for instance. You know? like, uh, most philosophy books have world in their title, mind too. But, uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but they, uh, the others say that it, it exists. So everybody says something about the world, and no one usually tells you what it is. And that's remarkable by itself. This got me to thinking about the world. Uh, when I bought Mind and World for the first time, I was like, oh yeah, interesting. I don't care so much about mind, but I want to know what McDowell, John McDowell, who has written this book, has to say about the world. Turns out he doesn't say anything about the world. There's one thing he says about the world. It's the totality of states of affairs, quoting Wittgenstein. But he doesn't tell you how he interprets Wittgenstein. That's very difficult to say what Wittgenstein might have meant by this. But he just drops it. So it's an entire book about mind and world, but you don't get world. It's like that. Imagine you buy a book about Italian cooking. And, uh, uh, and the book is uh, about all sorts of Italian things. Okay? It's about Italian architecture, it's about uh, Italian medicine, but it's never about cooking. Okay? And, and I think that uh, you would have very good reasons for being disappointed. So I will leave it at that, uh, and I look forward to uh, interview and discussion with you. Thank you very much. Um, I very much like your psychoanalytical destruction of uh, uh, ancient philosophy, by the way. But uh, 
Yeah. We're, not, we're not going to speak about that. We, we mm. are here actually, um, uh, I think it was only mentioned mm. very briefly, but I'm going to mention a little bit longer. Because of this, um, this is the book, mm. that is the Dutch version of it, um, which you can actually sell. Uh, we are a merchant nation, as you know, mm. so we're going to talk business first. Mm -hmm. um, you can sell the Dutch translation um, uh, after the lecture over there, and you can actually... <laughs> Buy. And, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, buy, <laughs> sorry, you sell it. Yeah, yeah, I uh, sell it, uh, yeah. you buy <laughs> sorry. it. Sorry, <laughs> that, that's the game we're in. Yeah, okay. Um, and you can yeah, actually... Maybe you have a different economy here, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, you would think. Um, and you can actually uh, buy it at a reduced price of 20 euros instead of 22.50. And you can get uh, Marcus' um, autograph. Uh, he's going to sign, so I would ask you to, um, to, to buy it. We have the, the <laughs> translator uh, here has done mm -hmm. a wonderful job. Hup, can you sort of write? Hup Stegeman has translated for Boom tran for Boom. Uh, Boom people mm -hmm. are here as well, uh, so we're very happy with that. And there's the unicorn. We're going the to unicorn. Oh yeah, I haven't I like said it. anything you like about it. Don't you like it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love it. It's yeah. a great yeah. cover. I, yeah. I like it better yeah. than the German cover. But <laughs> uh, uh, let me say b uh, just a yeah. word about the unicorn. Yeah. You know, I always say unicorns exist. One of my examples. Uh, and uh, here's a proof. Uh, the movie The Last Unicorn. So the, uh, any interpretation, you know this movie, maybe it's a, it's a child movie. Uh, anyway, so the, the plot is this. There's only one unicorn left and it's sad. And then blah, it does things, whatever. I don't recall any more details, but it's about The Last Unicorn. Okay, so, uh, the, and now you might say, uh, there is no unicorn in The Last Unicorn, but say a cleverly disguised pony who pretends to be a unicorn. But there's no evidence for that interpretation. So on any reasonable, rational interpretation of the movie, there's a unicorn in The Last Unicorn. And by my definition of existence, for which I've argued, there then is a unicorn, okay? Because the, for matters of existence are not settled by a provincial questions such as what is part of our universe. Our universe is only an ontological province. It's impressively big, but from an ontological point of view, it's infinitesimally small. But here's my question. Um, I have a moral objection against yeah. this because you're discriminating evil ponies. Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm serious. Okay. Um, oh. the, <laughs> really? Mm. Um, because, because why does your theory, can you, your theory mm. really allow you to say that it, it isn't? Mm. Uh, there might be a possible world in yeah. which there are evil ponies um, and these evil ponies might have somehow cleverly got themselves into this yeah. uh, movie and they're dressed up like unicorns, but they aren't. Yeah. How does your theory not allow for... Why do yeah. does your theory exclude this? And, and I think second question, mm. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm maybe asking mm. too many questions in one. Let, let's mm. just start okay, with this yeah. one. Okay. Aren't you discriminating yeah, yeah, yeah. evil yeah. ponies? And is yeah. your theory actually allowing you to exclude yeah. this possible yeah. world in which evil ponies dress mm -hmm. up like the mm -hmm. last unicorn and are, you know... Uh, uh, apart from the fact that I, I would be, you know, given that I, the, the world skepticism, I mm -hmm. would not put it in terms of possible worlds. Yes. But that does not really matter for your question, so I can yeah. rephrase it and then that's yeah. really, that doesn't carry the yeah. weight. Um, so I, uh, I think the question is something like this, but how do you know this? That's, mm -hmm. uh, and then I would say, well, that's my interpretation of the movie, mm -hmm. and it's defeasible. I might be wrong about that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, th but then I would go for the coloring book that my students gave me last Christmas. It's called Unicorns Are Jerks. And it's full of unicorns and how they fart in elevators and stuff like that. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, but it's a coloring book. Unicorns are, and it's full of unicorns. Mm -hmm. Yes, they might, uh, they might also not be unicorns. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, there's an alternative story to be told. Mm -hmm. And I have fallible beliefs about them. Mm -hmm. I do believe, uh, I'm, I don't think that I have a priori reasons to believe that there's mm -hmm. a unicorn in The Last Unicorn. Mm -hmm. I have defeasible empirical evidence for that. Uh, uh, um, uh, have you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. watched the movie. Ah. Uh, 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 um, <laughs> that is defeasible empirical evidence for the existence of unicorns. And also for the fact that they're not dressed up evil ponies. Yeah, yeah, that's why I say defeasible. So, uh, 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 I mean, the, you, uh, I think you're raising a question that, uh, that comes to people's mind a lot when they read this. Mm -hmm. um, say, yes, whatever, on some level I tend to agree. But what about the knowledge claims in the book? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I claim to know all sorts of things, like television is the best art, and you know, like I claim all sorts of things there. And how does he know this? Mm -hmm. You might wonder. Mm -hmm. You know, because I don't give arguments for all of this. Uh, um, 
And here's, uh, here's how I think about knowledge mm -hmm. on this level. I think that whenever we know something, we will have defeasible grounds. We will have good grounds uh, uh, um, to know something if we know something. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case in which we really know something, the good grounds are the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the case where we don't know something, the good grounds are only the good grounds. Mm -hmm. Let me turn this into a very simple example, then you see what I mean. So imagine I believe that I have uh, a hand in front of me on the basis of I feel my, ha my arm and I look at it. And now you're all looking at it and you're like, poor man, you know, you see that I have an amputated arm and everybody knows that uh, never mentioned to Marcus Gabriel that he lost his arm and uh, that I have this fa phantom hallucination, everybody knows this, etc. Okay, so this, this is a possible scenario. Mm -hmm. So how do I know that I have... Uh, and now I want to say, in the good case, let's call the good case the one in which I don't have an amputated arm. I think it's the good case. And uh, so in that case, uh, uh, um, the fact that there is an arm in front of me is, is the ground for me knowing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. The ground is the thing in that case. It's not mm -hmm. a mental entity. It's not that my reasons or my grounds are in my mind. In this case, the hand itself is my ground for believing that there's a hand. But, how, but then I think you, you can get to the reverse question. Yeah. How can you determine the facts if facts are situated in these um, fields of sense, Sinfelder? Yeah. Uh, how did you translate it? Sin, Sinfelder. Ah, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so you, you don't want to be a postmodernist. I'm going mm -hmm. to talk about mm -hmm. your enemies. I'm yeah, going yeah. to ask you about your enemies pretty soon. But... Um, so you don't want to, uh, as far as I can, see, uh, I can see, you consider yourself a realist. Mm. Um, you're also not a relativist, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Uh, but if there are these different sort of fields of sense, um, I might say, in my field of sense, mm -hmm. this guy there, mm. I'm sure I have very good grounds to assume that that's your evil twin brother. Mm. Uh, and you might say, I don't even have a, mm -hmm. a twin brother. In my, you no. know, in the, the family I was brought no. up, there was no twin brother, so not even a, an evil mm. twin brother. How, how do you escape that kind of, kind of thing? How can you talk about facts if they're situated in fields of sense, and mm -hmm. these fields of sense are infinitely plural? Yeah. How, how about facts then? How do you account for facts? Uh, well, for facts in general, it's easy. But for the, uh, 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 um, but uh, there's there's this argument in the, in the book and elsewhere which I call the argument from facticity. Mm -hmm. uh, the argument from uh, but I will relate this to what I think mm -hmm. uh, is the the tough uh, mm -hmm. uh, the tough core of your question. Um, so here's uh, here's the argument from facticity. The go it goes like that. So imagine. So first of all, what is a fact? Most philosophers say fact a lot, and then they never tell you what a fact is. Uh, here's what I think a fact is. Here's a definition. A fact is something that is true of something. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a fact that the moon is smaller than the earth means it's true of moon and earth that they stand in the following relation. The moon is smaller than the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so a fact is something that is true of something. And if you don't like the word true, I will say a fact is something that holds good of something, which mm -hmm. is my concept of being true, mm -hmm. holding good of. It's fine definition because I don't use the word twice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I'm saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I think a fact is. And now let's imagine someone who says there are no facts. Mm -hmm. So uh, someone who denies the, the existence of facts in that sense of fact. Mm -hmm. Well, then that person has to say that it holds good of some domain that it does not contain facts. Mm -hmm. But that would be a fact mm -hmm. by definition of fact. Mm -hmm. So facts are unavoidable. Mm -hmm. Something will be true. But then you just pluralize facts. Yeah. I mean, so, but isn't that sort of dodging the question? Because then you, you, sort, of, um, you sort of make the, the, the whole notion of fact into something that's true for whatever kind of talk you, you, you talk, yeah, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, but then the, yeah. whole, the whole idea of hard facts, for instance, yeah, no, is that's, gone. Yeah, that idea is completely gone. Ah, okay. yeah. The idea that some <laughs> facts are hard and others are not is completely gone. That would be a metaphysical idea in my understanding. That would be a confusion between the idea that there are facts and the preference, a predilegence mm -hmm. for certain facts. Yeah. So I don't think that they're hard facts. They're just facts. They're yeah, they're everywhere. just facts, yeah. There's the fact that thou shalt not kill. Uh, there's the fact that Picasso is a better painter than George Braque. There's the fact that my name is Marcus Gabriel and the fact that Angela Merkel is the chancellor of Germany and uh, plays the role of a Chinese dictator. Those are facts. I thought uh, it was the other yeah, way around. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, she's the dictator yeah, of yeah. China. Whatever, I she's a dictator and yeah, governs yeah, Germany. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, I was kidding yeah, Angela, yeah, sorry again yeah, for this yeah, one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Angela is a wonderful one. We gave her an honorary doctorate. I know, you know? So I know. Yeah, yeah. For, oh, I forgot, yeah, we had this over dinner. <laughs> okay, yeah. She's great. She's good, great. Good job. Yeah. yeah, vote for her. Oh. But, um, um, Not necessary, everybody else already does. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> but 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 then that, that don't you mm. run the risk of another isn't there another risk namely yeah. that the whole notion of fact is as trivial in your mm -hmm. in your in your work well i, yeah, I yeah. wouldn't say world but yeah. in your in your cosmos yeah. uh, <laughs> uh then then the notion of exist you just pluralize it i mean everything is a yeah. fact but then nothing is a fact i mean yeah. it's all the same it's all yeah. at the same level isn't that another risk doesn't that, that yeah. doesn't make it the whole meaningless? it would be it would be a risk if that book contained a metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So if I was saying that basically everything is a fact or basically everything exists, then I would have a metaphysics, a very mm -hmm. emptied out one, a deflationary metaphysics, if you like, mm -hmm. a metaphysics without skeleton, without bones. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it would pretty much be a metaphysics, but a crystal metaphysics. Mm -hmm. Now I can have all sorts of atmospheric metaphors, mm -hmm. but it's not a metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So the idea, I think the terminology that I employ, like uh, you're asking a, a, a very profound question, but, uh, um, but the, the terminology that I employ when I say existence and fact, etc., I think of these notions as completely devoid of meaning. They only have a function in the dialectical setting, the dialogical situation, in which I'm undermining the metaphysician's stance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they don't do any work in the sense that mm -hmm. once you know that there are facts, yeah. then this gets you somewhere. In a way, it's not your vocabulary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm, creating, I'm creating a vocabulary that is slightly better than the best vocabulary that I could find in contemporary theoretical yeah. philosophy. Yeah. It's slightly yeah. better than the best vocabulary out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then you kill it. And then I kill it. Yeah. I improve a little bit, and then I add one plus one, and the thing breaks yeah. down. It's that an adversarial philosophy. Yeah, yeah. that brings me to, to, to the last question. Before mm. we go, sort of uh, um, get to, to questions. Um, and that, that's, uh, I mean, one way of understanding your story. I mean, you went mm. through mm. it very quickly. People can read it uh, uh, in the book. But one way of understanding what a philosopher does is to understand uh, why he's who he's angry with and why he is yeah. so angry. Uh, so usually it's the anger that gets you going. Mm. Who who do you hate, and w and who or what do you hate, and why do you hate him or it so much? I mean, who or maybe are you? her or her. Uh, yeah. Leave it open. I yes, don't want to be yes, gender yes, biased yes, yes, yes. about who I hate. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> evil ponies. That we know. But yeah, uh, evil ponies are you don't like unacceptable. Yeah. Unacceptable. But, but uh, apart yeah. from evil ponies, who yeah. who I mean, who or what is it you hate and who yeah. you set up destroying in okay. your in your book? I would say that uh, ultimately uh, they play different roles in the book, and uh, if you read the book it's it's written in such a way and that's important for me that everybody can understand it who puts an effort into it okay so it's uh, it's as jargon free as i could possibly write it uh, because i think that philosophy should have this form for me clarity is the highest virtue in mm -hmm. philosophy it go, it's uh, uh, klarheit vor wahrheit i think clarity is more important than truth mm -hmm. i don't care about truth ultimately as mm -hmm. long as it's clearly laid out that's what i yeah, like about yeah, philosophy yeah. now i have three more questions for you yeah, but yeah, go okay, on yeah, okay yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, let me come back to this so uh, the two people that I uh, hate most are, and now I don't give you names, um, uh, it's not my mother, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, are the physicalist and the German Geisteswissenschaftler. Mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you wh who they are. Okay, so the physicalist is someone who says they are the hard facts, and the hard facts uh, are, uh, the, are the facts that you get from the natural science. Mm -hmm. So if you, know you want to know what there is, okay, uh, then ask physics plus chemistry plus biology, maybe n something with neuro attached mm -hmm. to it. Ask one of those. Ask someone concerned with neurons and schmurons. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that you got to talk to. That's one kind of group that I hate. I call them old realism in my book. Mm -hmm. I hate them not because I don't think that they're up quarks or, or, mm -hmm. or, or uh, uh, th uh, uh, th that doesn't you know, keep they me going. They usually are, but... Yeah, yeah. there are yeah. up quarks, yeah. I think. I'm a scientific realist. Yeah. Uh, so I think that science get, uh, discovers how things really are, mm -hmm. but it only studies one domain. So that's one enemy, physicalism, the idea that uh, the universe or, uh, or whatever uh, physics quantifies over settles the question of what there is. I think that's completely confused, and I think it's a leftover from the Cold War. As I put it today in Rotterdam, uh, the Cold War saw a, a major fight between two ideologies. Uh, the Russian ideology, historical dialectical materialism, which the, the Germans invented, like so many bad things, and uh, 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 um, and then on the other side, uh, I, I have a list of bad things in my mind. Forget that. Uh, and on the other side, what, what uh, about philosophy? But yeah, yeah, apart from philosophy, yeah, as yeah, I was yeah, saying. Yeah. 
and on the other side, American ideology. What, what, what's American ideology? It's historical dialectical materialism without history and without dialectics. So it's just materialism. <laughs> uh, and, uh, <laughs> and that's why it won. But it's they won. simpler. Yeah. You know, history yeah. is difficult. <laughs> dialectics, no one knows what that is. You let alone historical dialectical. You know, that, no one can know what that is. Histodiamat, that's yeah. too difficult. So the Americans, as they always simplified, they said, okay, then let's go with the materialism. And that's one of the enemies. Uh, and I think it's just ideological. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of philosophy is done under the assumption that we should be materialists. Why, 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 why is it an enemy? I mean, what does it do wrong, apart from the arguments? Okay, that it's false. Have? It's an enemy because it's false. Yeah, but uh, I mean, uh. many things are false. I mean, wh why is this specific th falsity yeah. so bad? I mean, yeah, because it structures, it's, uh, I think it structures our society in a very, very profound way. Uh -huh. You know, first of all, it structures the way that research funding is distributed over universities. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and where do, where's research funding come from? It depends on the country. But here and in Germany, it's, uh, it's tax money. So some of the money that, some, that someone steals from me every month in order to distribute it does not go to the homeless children and whatever people who are in need of it, mm -hmm. okay? A lot of this goes to people doing research in light of the assumption that they're identical with their brain, you know, the dick swaps of the, mm -hmm. the, uh, or uh, in light of the idea that there really are no colors but only electromagnetic waves. So a lot of my money, they take my money and yeah. spend it for a false <laughs> idea that is arguably false. So th that is, I think, a good reason. Yeah, but still, yeah. It's still, Okay, but, oh. but, but the governments, especially our government, oh. not only Angela Merkel, oh. sponsors lots of false ideas, but why is this particular false idea so bad? Why, why is it so wrong? Because I think it's, it's structuring contemporary philosophy. So uh, uh, um, most of contemporary philosophy is done in this framework. Mm -hmm. the, f the philosophical word for this is most of the time naturalism rather than mm -hmm. materialism. Mm -hmm. So most philosophy is done under the assumption that naturalism is somehow the guiding principle. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, if you catch me in my theological moments, oh, you uh, have them. Uh, yeah. uh, well, maybe you yeah. know, like I, I can. Yeah. The, uh, um, I'm just trying to get the religious people on my side yeah, for yeah, the Q and A. But then you know, like where the, where's the naturalism discourse coming from? It's a denial of the supernatural, and I think mm -hmm. that uh, um, this is where the term is coming from. It's 18th century Enlightenment discourse. This is where it enters the picture historically, and the function that it has is. Um, it wants to destroy, I think, um, the reality of mind, the reality mm -hmm. of subjectivity, and also the reality of illusions and ideology. Mm -hmm. And I think this is just a great way for ideology to hide itself politically. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you constantly say naturalism, 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 then you pretend that something which is really just your decision, your decision to treat people a certain way, is not your decision to treat them that mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. but it's natural. Mm -hmm. You know, like think of the evolutionary uh, accounts of the origins mm -hmm. of moral values. Mm -hmm. Same shape, mm -hmm. you know. I shouldn't kill you because uh, some other monkey also wouldn't kill you. Yeah. You know, I. But it's I don't kill. It's not that I refrain from killing you uh, because now I know that the other monkeys also don't do it. Mm -hmm. I refrain from killing you because it's true that the, the I shall not kill you. Mm -hmm. And and now, so we now know yeah. what the enemy is, uh, who he is, uh, and and now, so the world does not exist, and this helps beating the enemy. Uh, can you explain yeah. again? Why, why mm. that is an answer to the naturalist? Yeah. Why to yeah. the dick swap and I, I am my brain and that kind yeah, of yeah. That Because kind of I think that they, they only, they, they, uh, the justification, the theoretical justification for their claims, mm -hmm. okay, gets, uh, it's, uh, it's, it sounds like it has evidence on its side yeah. because it refers to the hard facts. Yeah. So the picture is there's a world, the world uh, consists of the hard facts, mm -hmm. and if you can uncover the structure and you're the scientific expert, okay, then you're responsible for that. Mm -hmm. I think it has, uh, now I can, uh, 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 it has a certain form. You know, it's like uh, 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 you, you want to have the expert who tells you what mm -hmm. things are. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's actually very helpful mm -hmm. uh, because you get rid of your own freedom, which I think is what drives people most. Uh, I think most of human activity can be interpreted as uh, uh, so many strategies of avoiding accepting that we're free and responsible and that we're just the assholes that we are. Uh, uh, and that this, uh, this means that we should get better. Yeah. I think a lot of human activity is centered yeah. around avoiding that insight. The problem with you is every answer generates three new questions, but I'm... Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, I will be... We'll get, no, 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 that's okay. very good, but oh. we'll get to the, the audience first, so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll keep them in reserve. Okay. Um, we're going to have a little experiment for Suterbeek-wise, um, because uh, usually you get 
to answer to ask questions at the end, but mm -hmm. you uh, will get your moment of glory now. Um, we're going mm -hmm. to uh, get a few questions from you. Uh, they will actually be projected, and then we go mm -hmm. from there. We go. Okay. Uh, you can you can answer them from there. I'll sort of rephrase them. Um, is there a, the microphone? Is the yeah? It's ready. Wait until you get the microphone. Ask a short question. I will rephrase the question. Mm. The, okay. the question will be typed yeah. um, real life uh, here. I think this gentleman over there. Um, the question is: um, you, you were talking about facts. Mm -hmm. And even uh, when the interviewer uh, asked you why you kept to the word fact, uh, I thought it was very confusing. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be helpful to say, instead of that you believe in, in facts and in uh, facticism, mm -hmm. that you were just simply hallucinating things? Mm -hmm. I think it's a question about the notion of fact again. I yeah. think we'll have to get back to... Yeah. And, fact and versus hallucination. And fact versus hallucination, fact versus fiction. And yeah. how he, yeah, he fact can... Fact and fiction is And really how, how he can um, yeah. make... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I will say that I know, but uh, uh, in a second, yeah. Yeah, distinction between fact yeah. and fiction. Yeah, okay. I yeah? think that... Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so, okay, okay, Stop. we're collecting all the questions. <laughs> okay, I see. You, can, you have time to think. You can Good. think that. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, the gentleman over here and then the gentleman there. All right. Um, this perhaps ties into the previous question, but you talked about the fact uh, that the Earth is uh, bigger than the moon, or in fact, yeah. the moon being smaller. Um, but how does this relate to the idea that we don't have facts about these things simpliciter? We have perspectives on, well, mm -hmm. I'll get to that. Mm -hmm. But from the perspective of an astronaut, this relation is reversed. Mm -hmm. The fact the moon is, mm -hmm. from his perspective, bigger mm -hmm. than the Earth is. Mm -hmm. And what exactly is this perspective that he has of the moon what is mm -hmm. it of yeah mm -hmm. yeah great question yeah notion of perspective yeah, 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 perspe notion yeah. Of, i think you get the question yeah. yeah i get the question yeah and someone can add the moon then i yeah recall. Ju just do moon perspective yeah, yeah. And perspective moon. moon and then yeah, yeah we'll get there <laughs> uh think here up front yeah. uh, there and then yeah yeah uh my question, the short version is, how does this story relate to phenomenology? And the long, mm -hmm. slightly longer version is, I would say, this, especially in the Vesuvius example, my point of view is somehow more important because it's my point of view, it's my access to other mm -hmm. uh, fields of sense. And uh, how does subjectivity, you hinted at it in mm -hmm. your lecture, how does that fit into this picture and the Lebenswelt? Notion of subjectivity yeah. and phenomenology yeah. and and slash phenomenology, yeah. Mm. Uh, sorry, very good. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, no, yeah. Um, yeah. My question Thank would Jesus. be because um, <laughs> if there is no if there is no causal relationship between um, an electromagnetic wave and a color, simply mm -hmm. how does causation work in your theory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. the notion of causation in in this in this. Uh, Notion of course, causality. Maybe two final ones because we've got like the gentleman here and then over there. Yeah? Hi. Um, you have a, well, a persuasive uh, argument for uh, that the world does not exist in the sense of a positive definition as something mm -hmm. and all encompassing. Can you, can you uh, speak in the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Um, what about a uh, negative definition of the world as something that is set opposed to the subject? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Have you got arguments against that? I th is that can... Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you mean that he should allow for that or...? Um, well... He doesn't mention it, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, his thoughts about okay, it. Okay. Yeah. And then I think we had a final question there, yeah? yeah? I oh, already got the mic, yeah. Yeah, I also kind of, with my question, wanted to see if there's a way to save the world. Mm -hmm. um, Why would you? Yeah, yeah. yeah because yeah. my question actually is, uh, I saw also y your video on uh, TEDx, mm -hmm. 
And uh, my question is why, um, I know why you are so upset with the notion of the world, but um, the, the sense fields do allow for almost everything to exist. So mm -hmm. couldn't I just say, well, I saw a movie about the world. Yeah, and there is a movie with the title, a Chinese movie. Yeah, should, yeah. So, is, Chinese so the is, yeah. is there a problem yeah. with yeah. the notion of the world? He does not only discriminate evil ponies, but also the world. You okay. mean. Yeah, you, you, you discriminate yeah. the world, and yeah. apart from what maybe Plato or someone meant mm. by the world once, maybe we can yeah. still give it some meaning. Yeah, yeah. Well, why do you deny the world? I mean, couldn't you say that there is a Sinnfeld in which the, wo the world has yeah. a meaning? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Yeah. A classic. And can you get that? Okay, um, let's start. Oh, we have the problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the first one is a very, very crucial mm. one, I think. Mm. Um, uh, in your theory, where you, where you say uh, there's no hard facts, mm. we now know why you say it's directed mm. against, indeed, uh, the likes of, of Dick Swap, naturalists, people who mm. reduce us to particles or to neurons or, or whatever. But if there are no hard facts, if everything is fact, why, how can we then make sense of the distinction between fiction and fact? And, and it, I think you should, because um, you, we, we, we should still be able to, to I, I should be mm. able to tell you, no, 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 now you're fantasizing. This is, this is not true. This is fiction. Mm -hmm. But if, if fact is anything which happens to be in some sort of sinveld, how then can you distinguish mm -hmm. between fact and fiction? I think it's a very important mm -hmm. question. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think that let me start by uh, the uh, answering by drawing by arguing that the fact fiction distinction is not substantive but functional. Here's what I mean by this. So uh, a substantive distinction is something, okay, uh, uh, that uh, once we grasp it, we know something about that which the distinction applies. Uh, so you could say that uh, uh, the fictional objects. Uh, I know something about fictional objects if I know that they are fictional. They are fictional objects. Okay, for mm. instance, or fictional characters. I know something about Faust. He's a fictional character. Mm -hmm. And now it, uh, I discover something about Faust. And we think that this is uh, the right way of looking at fact and fiction because we have examples in mind such as someone hallucinates something uh, uh, and turns out it's false. So when we say fiction, I think it, comes, it enters our language uh, because we want to draw that particular kind of distinction of a form of error that is not quite an error. A well-grounded form of mistake, that's, uh, that's kind of what we associate with that. But now, I don't think that the fact-fiction distinction is substantive, but merely functional. Here's, here's how and why. Uh, there is embedded fiction. So imagine Faust hallucinates something, which he does. He hallucinates a lot. Arguably, on some readings, he hallucinates everything yeah. after he gets the, uh, the drink by the witch in the, the uh, witch uh, mm -hmm. uh, Hexenküche. So in that famous scene, from then on he starts hallucinating, certainly does. For instance, it's perfectly imaginable that uh, Gretchen is an, an incredibly ugly person, and, uh, he, but he gets this drink and uh, as uh, uh, Mephisto says, from now on you will see Helen in every woman, so, uh, because he started hallucinating. <coughs> uh, so, uh, so there's embedded fiction, meaning uh, there are fictional fictional characters, as Saul Kripke has called this recently in a book, Re Reference and Existence. They're fictional, fictional characters. So the distinction between fact and fiction cannot be the distinction between a fictional <coughs> world and the real world. Because within the so-called fictional world, there's an embedded fictional world. That is why it's not a substantive issue, the fact, fiction. It's an epistemic issue, meaning we, s we sometimes say that something is fact versus fiction because we want to draw a distinction between kinds of knowledge. And we somehow think, we are used to the idea that if I know something about the content of my hallucination, then somehow that is less valuable information than when I know something about my environment by perceiving it. And I also would doubt that. I think from the standpoint of human survival interests, it's very helpful uh, to, uh, uh, to point out, <coughs> to, give better, to give better credits to, to uh, perceivings, to perceptions, than to hallucinations. But that is an entirely contingent matter about human beings. Uh, um, so I don't think that if you really look close at the fact-fiction distinction, I think it's, it's, uh, it's much less useful and clearer than it appears. So, yeah. Yeah. 
That's what I do think. Yeah. 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 Because uh, because it's important to notice how these things that seem to be merely fictional, okay, how they structure human life. They are, first of all, social facts have the logical form of hallucinations. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, there's uh, on some level we hallucinate that money has value, mm -hmm. or that there are governments. Okay, I don't perceive this on, in some level of perceiving. So these illusions uh, and uh, hallucinations, as a, or let's call them illusions, and have this be a very broad category. There are many distinctions to be drawn, but let's say we have a good m understanding of that. Then I want to say they're as real as it gets. And for human life, they're even realer than most of the so-called hard facts. You know, mm -hmm. for, uh, 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 right. Just imagine, you know, like human life has not been governed a lot by our beliefs about up quarks until very recently, mm -hmm. but it has been governed by beliefs about the, uh, the beauty of Jesus Christ or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or the, uh, uh, the, this is just one example of, mm -hmm. out of many. So I think ideas, if you like, even mm -hmm. even wrong ones, even illusions, but uh, are very powerful, but causally but powerful. But do, do I get you right? So so isn't this in in, the, in 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 a way you could say this is back to let's say anti psychiatry of the 70s that the whole notion of, for instance, being realist about facts about sanity is a, is a construction. Is that what you mean? Because it yeah. would it would end up be, any hallucination is just. Oh, no, 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 not at all. No, no, not at all. So, so where, where exactly yeah. do you situate yourself? I think, that, I think that our mental life consists in part of hallucinations and in part of perceptions. And sometimes think that uh, things that we take to be perceptions are illusions and the other way around. Mm -hmm. So I think we're nicely anchored in reality, if you like, in mm -hmm. the, although nicely anchored. Uh, uh, and there are uh, all sorts of facts that we can easily take for granted. But, but what then is a distinctive characteristic of a hallucination? Vis-à-vis -a, -vis a a a a a that it's perception. That, that, that it's you, you can't say it's about belief. the world. No, it's false belief. It's truth versus falsity. Hallucinations are false uh, within a certain sense. But field. that's a different question. How do I know? Is a different question from what is something. Mm -hmm. So, the, 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 and I see that this is this uh, the, uh, this will always come up. But it's uh, uh, which is why in many of the questions. So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, the, the problem is yeah, we okay. we're recording this and you okay. don't have a microphone. So okay. yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, how do I know what is a fact and what is hallucination? Well, by the ordinary ways. Let, let me tell you a story, which I call the gorilla argument. If you don't think it's an argument, then just call it the gorilla. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the mm -hmm. gorilla. Uh, and I, uh, this is, uh, um, and I, there's an argument behind this, but maybe it helps. So, uh, uh, to understand, I'm not saying that I'm pushing it on you, but here's just as a clarificatory point. Uh, so the, the brilliant comedian Louis C.K., who has this TV show called Louis, anyways, and on that TV show, so he's the best comedian, that's the assumption, and he is. And uh, 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 in that show, uh, you know, he is having breakfast with his two children. And uh, they are absolutely brilliant too, and uh, which he figures out over the season, whatever. And then one of his daughters says, I know a joke, Daddy. And Daddy says, well, look, basically says, I'm the most brilliant comedian in the world. Whatever joke you're trying to tell me, I will either already know it or know why it's not funny. So you will never make me laugh with a joke, okay? I'm the Hegel of jokes. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and then the child starts this joke, and uh, the joke goes like this. Uh, who did not let the gorilla into the ballet? And Louis sta immediately starts laughing because he has no idea, and it's so funny. Who did not let the gorilla into the ballet? And then uh, his daughter says, whoever was in charge of that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and I think that's, uh, 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 so for me the question whether something is a fact or hallucination in the more ordinary sense of the question is uh, perfectly empirical. I don't think it's a philosophical question. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's a piece, I can only all, uh, answer this piecemeal. I don't think there's a broad distinction between fact and fiction or perception and hallucination such that if I only know what that distinction is, it helps me orient myself in my empirical inquiry into what is the case and what is hallucinated. But then, then you have the next question. What do you mean by empirical? Yeah. You don't mean the, the swap kind no, of No, no, I don't mean that at all. But yeah. What then do you mean? Yeah. By empirical, I mean our activity of, uh, of distinguishing between true and false belief. Mm -hmm. That's how, uh, this is how I... I, I the, mm -hmm. My notion of empirical here is as thin as my notion of fact and of yeah. existence. Yeah. yeah. I don't mean by empirical opening my eyes or you or running an experiment or 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 collecting data. Uh -huh. Did, th then we go. I mean, mm. we we go back to the question. Yeah. We were still bu busy with the question of fact, fact fiction, but mm. 
Hmm. It leads to a question of, indeed, in we already hinted that, you already hinted hmm. at this, your vocabulary. And I think there was, a, in one of the questions, mm -hmm. was also about this. So y you hate all that. M metaphysics is out, ontology is in. Yeah. And metaphysics has invented all this vocabulary yeah. of, you know, existence and, 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 and facts and empiric substance and empirical and accidents substance and accidents, all this rubbish, you know? Yeah. Now, it, it, it seems that there's a problem with you, and I, I'm, mm, I'm inquiring mm. the, about having to write this book mm. uh, and uh, funny enough it reminds me of Heidegger whom you don't want to be associated with for very good reasons mm. uh, who said that his philosophy is, is, is so new is about mm. such new thoughts that he had to invent this Heideggerian mm. fake <laughs> vocabulary but somehow you seem to be in the same boat I mean you use all this vocabulary but then you say no it's very thin it's very thin it's empirical yeah. it just means you know anything facts means everything isn't that isn't this a problem for you? But shouldn't you have used indeed new words, not empirical, but shrimpirical yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or or whatever? Is is this indeed a problem for you? Or? Well, I, I I tend to use uh, as often as I can non-philosophical vocabulary. Yeah. So mm. even I have a fact is not a philosophical term. No. I mean, there are philosophical interpretations of the term, yeah. uh, um, uh, but it's not necessarily a philosophical term in the strict sense. Mm -hmm. all, all sorts of people throw the word around. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to use in the book. I'm I'm trying to just speak a language without thinking about the sociology of it. Yeah. Like if I say this word, then people will think I'm a phenomenologist, and if I say that other word, they will think I'm that or whatever. So mm -hmm. I, I uh, I'm not addressing, if you like, uh, yeah. uh, the philosophical yeah. audience on yeah. that level. Yeah. I'm just trying. It's uh, it has more the shape of Descartes' meditations. Uh, on that level, you know, Descartes sat down and he's like, okay, let's settle that. I mean, there's all this scholasticism. Yeah. This is the spirit of in which he write the, writes the meditations. Mm -hmm. There's all the scholasticism. I'm aware of it. I like it somehow, but I, then I also don't like yeah. it. So let me sit down and just figure it out. Mm -hmm. So this, and then he sat down. This mm -hmm. is uh, this is uh, this is more the attitude yeah. in which it's written. Uh, so uh, uh, let's just say things and see where it gets us, rather than care so much about. Uh, um, but the, the, the one important thing is that um, the thin vocabulary... Okay, so here's, here's roughly how I think about this. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a, 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 a profound methodical question, a metaphilosophic question. So what mm -hmm. do we even think is philosophy? I mean, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. this is really yeah. at stake yeah. also in this exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I think what's going on is something like this. So I don't think like many philosophers sometimes <laughs> do. Wittgenstein every once in a while thinks things like that. And, uh, but people have believed that our ordinary vocabulary is somehow fine. If things are good, as long as, you just, uh, as long as you're not at all a philosopher, all right. But then everybody constantly is a philosopher. The physicist is a philosopher. Uh, uh, everybody on the supermarket, in my supermarket is a philosopher. So everybody already is a philosopher. So you can't come up with the idea that there's a, a good commonsensical ordinary language and that this gets distorted by philosophy. That, that purity doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Philosophy is already there because the language has uh, the history of millennia infected by philosophy. Uh, 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 that yeah. goes into it. So th th that pure language isn't there. Mm -hmm. But I try to speak a language that's there and purify it from the metaphysical uh, uh, surrounding. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a form of therapeutical philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, but one which is more optimistic about philosophy. Mm -hmm. Many therapeutical philosophers, you know, the, ske the skeptics in ancient philosophy, uh, uh, the Wittgensteinians, etc., mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they hate philosophy. Mm -hmm. They think that philosophy shouldn't exist. I love philosophy. I think philosophy mm -hmm. is great. Uh, why? Because it helps us uh, um, getting a little bit clearer about the philosophical vocabulary that we already employ. The, then the next question, uh, which again leads no. us from this question, but I think it's just an important question. Who, I mean, we have talked about your enemy here, but mm -hmm. who's your friend? I mean, who, mm -hmm. who are you talking to in this book? Mm -hmm. uh, because you, you, you talk about common sense vocabulary, you try to phrase the book without too much mm. technical uh, yeah. uh, technical vocabulary. Indeed, the vocabulary you do, do use, you have a list mm -hmm. at the end, which is I think is very uncommon for a German mm -hmm. philosophy, if mm -hmm. I may say so. Uh, I, I mean, should Heidegger? I mean, Heidegger should have done, but yeah. he probably couldn't. But um, um, so it's very, it's a very uh, maybe the, the whole lecture went very quickly for you. But if you if you read the book, it's very accessible. Uh, you can really follow it step by step like maybe mm. the meditations of, of Descartes. So is the book written for, let's say, the common sense, the, mm -hmm. the common audience, not for your, for your colleagues? Or who, who are you talking to in this book? And why mm. are you talking to that person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, I'm talking to the widest possible audience that inhabits the public sphere, 
-hmm. and wants to be rational about their use of language. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and people who are perplexed about the question, questions such as how does science relate to religion? How does art relate to religion? Mm -hmm. How does philosophy relate to all of this? Uh, what's the meaning of life? Mm -hmm. So the, the basic, uh, or, or uh, how do I know that I'm not hallucinating right now? Mm -hmm. uh, the, I use examples from my own childhood there mm -hmm. that I never forgot, philosophical examples such as I went to school, a drop of water fell into my eye, and I saw a street lantern twice. It was doubled due to the optical effect. And then I wondered, well, if I now see two, if I, had, I only, had I always seen two uh, lamps there, I would have uh, judged that there are two lamps. So mm -hmm. why do I think that there's one lamp? Okay, so how do I choose between one lamp and many lamps then? It seems arbitrary, uh, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. So, and I think those are perfectly natural questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, I remember I once gave a similar topic uh, um, to a white audience in Germany and a child after this said, so are you saying nothing is bigger than everything? Mm -hmm. And then I said, yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. <laughs> And then she said, I've always been saying that to my mother, but she doesn't understand me. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and, uh, and I think that the child was perfectly right. Yeah. I'm 100% I'm a, a sure that her vision of things was exactly the kind of vision that I had in mind. And she put it like that. Nothing is bigger than everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so she saw that at some point or other, I would accept this premise, which was a very important premise for her. And finally, someone gets it. And this is how I th this is I think that the philosophical questions are as natural, and I think that professional philosophy, even at its best, sometimes mm -hmm. forgets the simplicity of these questions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, uh, 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 and I want to bring them back. Mm -hmm. That's also another sense in which I want to be a realist. Mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, even though philosophy has been very has become very complicated and professional and great at that. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I'm not deploring the professionalization of philosophy. What I am deploring is that sometimes, um, or a lot of the times actually, we forget how our thoughts, even in the purest era of the uh, area mm -hmm. of theoretical philosophy, are grounded in very commonsensical experience, mm -hmm. uh, experiences that every child has or everybody who takes LSD mm -hmm. uh, or, or watches a movie or is unhappy, mm -hmm. etc. So just very everyday experiences. Mm -hmm. This is where this is where the story. This is where this is commonsensical. Mm -hmm. uh, but but. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah um, I will say something. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but, but then, then, if if that is mm. if that is true, and and this is important, why is it so important? And let me let me mm -hmm. let me ask this question a bit more yeah. uh, provocative way. Uh, you know, in ten years, we will have finally have uh, Europe as a federal state. We will have one national anthem, alle Menschen werden Brüder. Uh, we will have one army. Mm. And we'll have one philosophy, which is taught mm. at the, the Grundschule all over Europe, mm. namely Gabrielism. Mm -hmm. you, you win. Yeah, new yeah. realism. Let's new call realism. It new realism. New realism. Yeah. But yeah. then it will be. I want to pretend Gabrielism. that it's not my doctrine. Okay. Yeah. You win. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Suppose you win. Yeah. Uh, so this is being taught, and people are asking philosophical questions in your way. Your answers are being discussed. It's already taught in German high schools, by the way. But okay. Really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how does the society look like? I mean, what is it going to change with people? If you say mm. it's so commonsensical, it's rooted in their common sense, what is, what is indeed, I mean, let's, let's put it a little bit you know, evangelical, mm. what is mm. the message and yeah, how are course. people going to be helped yeah. with it? And how, is our, how yeah. are we going to change? Because obviously yeah. there's some reason why. I, th I think that a lot of things that are realities, but we cover them up with, uh, with uh, ideological stories, a lot of these realities will appear the way they are without mm -hmm. the cover-up. Mm -hmm. Let me give you the very simple contemporary hardcore example. I mean, right now it looks as if Europe, I'm talking about Europe, so there is something European going on there, uh, and it's quite central. Uh, it looks as if Europe is the, the pl uh, where everybody's a nihilist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so oh. you might say Europe is the, is the place for nihilists. What are nihilists? Well, nihilists believe that there are really no values out there, but that we create values, and now we have a hard time creating them, so we are a little bit weak. You know, we are weak Europeans now. Mm -hmm. We are creating values, but we don't really believe in them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that's false. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, um, Europe is built on heavyweight value uh, mm -hmm. uh, machinery, and that, uh, and we need to say what those values are and commit to them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, paradoxically, in the current uh, climate in the Near East, what's coming out there is that a lot of, you know, like. Where, where do all the so-called European jihadists come from? Mm -hmm. okay? They are those people who think that they should be disappointed by nihilism. 
They want something. They want a truth. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can give them the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth is, thou shalt not kill, mm -hmm. uh, um, etc. Mm -hmm. don't, don't kill children for breakfast. Give a welfare state to everybody, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that the, the many European values that distinguish Europe as a place, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, make your cities look like museums, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, um, etc., etc. Those values are there, and we need to accept them as realities mm -hmm. and not pretend that they are mere helpful constructions, etc. So mm -hmm. this is uh, uh, the realism, I think, in this uh, in this view yeah. will help us see realities that are already there, mm -hmm. and uh, it makes it harder to think of politics as a system of manipulating people into actually false beliefs. Mm -hmm. If truth and fact and rea realism, etc., if those are the important words mm -hmm. for our uh, describing what we're doing in philosophy, if those are the big words, mm -hmm. then, we can, uh, we, uh, then we have a problem with lying and manipulating, mm -hmm. which we should as philosophers, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. But now look at, at the recent history of philosophy the last hundred years, starting with Nietzsche and maybe earlier. People wanted to say that lying is not that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, Nietzsche is a philosopher, he's trying to tell you lying is not that bad in philosophy. Uh, he's lying all the time. Yeah. You know, uh, he doesn't say a true word. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, I think it's outrageous. I don't mm -hmm. want to say it's like, oh yeah, but it's so beautiful. It's beautiful, all right, but mm -hmm. it's a system of lies. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and I think this is, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the message. The mm -hmm. message is uh, truth will make you free. Mm -hmm. Wow, uh, we'll come back to that. But I think this yeah, you is very important. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Message, I give to, then you, it's, uh, you, you get. Uh, oh, no, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, so let's get back to the moon. <laughs> okay. Um, the moon example. So ah, yeah. we have different perspectives. How can you still talk yeah. about facts ah, yeah. then? Okay. That yeah, the question. moon is a good. Uh, the moon is a very good one. Uh, uh, um, the size of the moon, because here's uh, here's something that also keeps me going in a very similar context. Um, uh, specks and stars. So you, you look at you look at the night sky, and uh, uh, there's a sense in which you don't see stars, but specks. Why? Because you can cover up what you see with your finger, but of course you cannot cover up a star with your finger. So uh, uh, many phenomenologists have concluded that you don't really see stars, but specks of stars. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so epoche, whatever, you know, you, we never get to the stars themselves. Maybe there aren't any stars, but they're only specks. And now the, the moon example is an interesting version of that, because while you stand on the moon, you can cover up the earth with your hand, but not the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, so suddenly there's a sense in which at least the moon appears to be smaller than the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the, 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 and that bigger. is why... The, bigger. Uh, yeah, bigger, yeah. yeah. And that is why the sense in which the, the, the moon is smaller than the earth, the mm -hmm. sense in which the moon is smaller than the earth, has to be an aperspectival <laughs> fact mm -hmm. that we can only grasp through perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, but the perspectives uh, that we employ in order to get to the truth uh, are uh, mere vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, here, here's one way of looking at uh, the meaning of the word empirical mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. in this context. What would it mean to empirically figure out that the uh, while standing on the moon, that uh, living on the moon forever, that the moon is actually smaller than the Earth. What would it actually? So what would it mean to figure this out? Well, it would mean to employ reasoning, for instance. You would do this, the kinds of things that a physicist and a geometer on Earth, you know, like an ancient Greek geometer who figures out that the Earth is round, which they mm -hmm. did, of course. Mm -hmm. What they would have done. So mm -hmm. you t you take the evidence and collect it. So being empirical here does not mean opening your eyes because that will mislead you most mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. It means collecting all the data using valid inference patterns. And, uh, and then figuring out how things are. Might we be wrong about this? Yes, we might. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, 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 but, I, uh, but I think still, I think that this, this was the background of the question. Who decides what then is the right perspective yeah. for there to be, you know, what an empirical fact is? But because the notion of empirical fact means somehow something we can determine, so in, indeed mm -hmm. something we can infer. But if in a world, in, well, mm. there is no world, but yeah, in yeah. your world so, yeah, where sure, there are I only perspectives, yeah. who then decides about the right perspective? How do we do this? And how, how is this contained? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, but in well, a way yeah, it's yeah, the same I'm question. A, uh, um, okay. Uh, with the, a few qualifications, when you asked yeah. me about the theory of truth, with a few qualifications, yeah. we had a similar discussion this morning, but... Okay, uh, but let me repeat just a, When it comes to truth, I'm a minimalist with certain qualifications. So what is minimalism? Minimalism says that all you need to know about truth are certain platitudes. 
such as that if someone has a true belief, then what the, what the person believes is the case. Mm -hmm. That's a platitude. There's nothing profound about this, completely mm -hmm. trivial. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think there's nothing spectacular about truth beyond certain platitudes. I don't think that truth, for instance, has anything to do with the relation between our mind and what is the case. So the fact that we have a mind and make up our mind while figuring out something, okay, is our way of gaining access to certain truth, to mm -hmm. certain facts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, but truth is not a property of the mind, or of propositions, or of mm -hmm. sentences, or of utterances, etc. Truth is, uh, is a, a very minimal thing. We can do certain things with it in our language. It has certain syntactical features. Uh, uh, you know, this has been pointed out by minimalists. Minimalists believe things such as, you know, if you say, uh, whatever Jesus said was true. You know, imagine Jesus only spoke the truth and he was the son of God and he knew all the truth. Imagine. That's theologically not correct anyways. But let, let's take another guy. Okay, Schmises. So, uh, whatever, uh, and sh actually, whatever, sh Schmises only says true things for whatever reasons. And now I can say whatever Schmises says is true. Uh, and uh, so the truth predicate in this case only helps me simplify this. What I mean is, uh, Schmiese says uh, uh, water is liquid, uh, therefore water is liquid. So it just licenses me to accept everything that Schmiese says. But it's not that everything that Schmiese says has a metaphysical property mm -hmm. being true. Uh, so uh, uh, that's a, uh, you can do certain things with the truth predicate in our language, mm -hmm. and the truth predicate uh, exhibits certain patterns mm -hmm that are utterly m minimal, uh, they are platitudes. So, uh, so, 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 so you mean, w yeah. what you're saying, so truth again, it, and it's a notion that philosophers have been worried about like yeah. 2000 years, again, again you say, I, I don't, you don't worry about it too much. Yeah, there's you, nothing you, there's to be nothing worried about. Worried. Yeah, yeah. It, but it's, not, it's just not very important. It's just a very handy notion we, some, yeah. some scientists use, but it's not you know, ontologically important. It's a metaphysically yeah. important yeah, notion, yeah. but not ontologically. Yeah. Not for your ontology. Yeah, is, yeah. Is that well, what you're saying? I, yeah, when it comes to the theory of truth, I think we only have to work out why we think there's more going on than the platitudes, which is not that mm. simple. That's why, I, you know, like, there, there are various tribes of minimalists. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 some, things that, uh, some think that uh, uh, the word truth can be entirely disposed of, that's a, a classical strategy from, you know, it's called the redundance theory of truth. You don't even need the word. Then others say you do need it, but it's not a property. Then others say you do need it and it's a property, and etc. So the discussion doesn't end there. Mm -hmm. But what all minimalists have in common is the idea that uh, uh, when you think about truth, you're not thinking about a, a, a representing system of any kind. Mm -hmm. So the question is not, how does, you, how does something get into your brain or whatever? <coughs> so that's, yeah. uh, 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 that question is, uh, becomes completely secondary. Yeah, you, 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 you do teach epistemology. Yeah. I mean, traditionally, yeah. epistemology is indeed about the way our knowledge relates to the world. Yeah. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. What do you teach your students then? I mean, uh, about the notion um, of truth. Uh, well, platitudes about how the word knowledge works. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know, like every, everybody in contemporary epistemology that I know of agrees that uh, the verb to know has a feature that we call factivity. It's quite trivial. It means that if someone knows something, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, what, what they know is true, is the case. If I know that it's raining, then it is raining. From the fact that I know that it's raining, it logically follows that it's raining. Mm -hmm. That feature is called factivity. Mm -hmm. But now you might, uh, you might be confused about this because you can say, but how do I know that I know? Mm -hmm. So I need arguments to the effect that the question, how do I know that I know, has nothing to do with the question, how do I know? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so this is, this is what I teach them, to sort out the various elements mm -hmm. and to, to draw distinctions, for instance, between knowing and cognizing. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can I, for instance, I think that uh, knowing is not a mental state. Mm -hmm. you could, uh, um, cognizing is. You know, I now cognize you, meaning mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, my organism, etc. There are all sorts of things going on that allow me to have a, a mental appearance as if of you from here. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, that's fine, but that's not knowing. Knowing has a, has a different logical form, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean that knowing is a different entity. It's not mm -hmm. that in my mind there's cognition and knowing. Knowing mm -hmm. is not even in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, here, here's an example. Yeah. Like, let, let me give yeah. you a feeling for how I deal with epistemological yeah. questions. A very simple one, something that I'm working on right now. So uh, imagine, you know, I point to anyone, say, ask Niels, uh, uh, I say, Niels, um, did you know 
that more than seven Indian people, people living in India, have shoes. And he would say, of course I know that. But now, the, another question, have you ever thought about it? No, of course not. So, uh, uh, obviously, you can know all sorts of things uh, uh, re relative about which you don't even have an opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, knowledge can be a mental state. Mm -hmm. You know much more than you think you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you in know infinitely many things. Mm -hmm. you, know that se uh, you know that more than seven Indian people have shoes. You know m that more than eight Indian people have shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you can see how easy it is to generalize on that basis so that they can demonstrate that everybody knows infinitely many things. Mm -hmm. But infinitely many things do not have, cannot play, uh, find a place in the energy system that is your brain. So uh, uh, those are reasons that I employ in order to show that the brain is not the subject of knowing. But For we, instance, I, I think I'm, that, that yeah. brings us, I think, very neatly to the, to the yeah. next question, which is about the notion of the subject. There was a notion about phenomenology, that's yeah. the philosophical term, but you, mm -hmm. you can talk about it if you like. But what is the mind? What is the subject? And so if you say yeah. knowledge is not about our representation yeah. in the mind, about the world being true, what then is it? And, yeah. and, and how does the mind have a place in your, in your, in your system? Yeah. And yeah. Maybe a, a yeah. word or two about the place mm. of phenomenology. Uh, in it. Yeah, yeah I'm, try I'm currently working on that question. Uh, pr actually, I'm writing the, the, the sequel to this is going to be called I is not brain, ich ist nicht gehirn. And it's about exactly about that. Okay, so it's the anti swap. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. I start yeah. with the dick swap uh, ah, uh, uh, at the very beginning. I was really pleased to find out about dick swap thanks to yeah. Bohm. Yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't know about its existence. I yeah. love it when uh, uh, I love it when my enemies really exist. <laughs> yeah. It's bad. If, it's, it's bad if you have all these non-existing enemies because uh, then your therapy gets more expensive. You know, yeah. you certainly yeah. have to go back. <laughs> uh, uh, so dick swap has helped me. Yeah. Uh, 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 being less crazy. Yeah. Uh, I thought I was making them up, but they exist. Yeah. So that's good. Uh, uh, good news. Um, so subjectivity. So I do think n n uh, I'm trying to work out the idea that uh, what we call a subject or subjectivity is a set of potentially misleading appearances. This is how I would put it. Mm -hmm. For instance, it's potentially misleading that I see you from here. Why? Okay, I see you from here, and my perspective is, of course, due to optical laws, etc., distorted. I don't see you. The, 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 the uh, geometry of my visual field is not Euclidean. People sometimes forget this. Kant, for instance. Uh, uh, but the visual, my visual field does already not have a Euclidean geometry, quite trivially. If you look at tracks, okay, they are not parallel in a Euclidean way. They meet in the horizon. That's certainly not a feature of a Euclidean geometry, and I can literally see it. So, uh, uh, or I can, I can, in that sense, literally see uh, that the moon is extremely small. It's smaller than my finger. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, the, the moon that is smaller than my finger, the speck and the, and the tracks, mm -hmm. that is subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So, a set of potentially misleading uh, uh, appearances. I say potentially because you can correct the factor of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, often it's quite easy, sometimes it's quite hard. It's particularly hard when it comes to human relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, and, and, and there, our everyday life with other human beings, uh, that is also the basis for the mm -hmm. ethics that <clears throat> goes with this conception of mind, is that our everyday life, what is it? Well, it has exactly the, the shape of friendship, meaning that, uh, uh, that we constantly correct each other when it comes to the appearances that we are creating in other people and the appearances that they make on us. So we are constantly mm -hmm. exchanging beliefs about <coughs> how we appear to other people and how this might be potentially misleading. Of course, we also create potentially misleading appearances in order to trick people. It's called economy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, uh, 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 that's also going yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, but that is, uh, uh, so subjectivity is there, but uh -huh. it's a set of potentially misleading appearances. That's the idea. So, you are no self theorist? I mean, isn't that, isn't that very strange? Because I have yeah, the distinctive yeah. feeling that yeah. I am sitting yeah. here, but now yeah, you, yeah. you are telling me that I'm wrong? How, how can you do that? No, no, no. I'm very happy. I'm not saying there's no I. I think ah. that the sense, w you know, it's true that I am sitting here, meaning I, uh, I equals a set of potentially misleading appearances. I can tell I don't you. I experience it as p potentially misleading. I mean, in my yeah, experience, yeah. I am sitting here, just yeah. period. Yeah. Nothing misleading about that. Yeah. So th this is my sin sinfet. Why yeah. are you now destro destroying my sinfet? Yeah. Well, if you mean by I, you know, case, then, uh, then you are sitting there. 
and uh, and now you can say, but whose case? And then I would say, well, you probably mean something like um, a, a temporal guy. slice of a four-dimensional object <laughs> that was born at this particular, you know, like, and then does that exist? Oh yeah, uh, that yeah. exists. Uh, so I, I I wouldn't doubt that. Uh, um, but uh, but then there's of course the philosophical question of I when mm -hmm. I say the, the subject, and then I mean something like whatever holds my mental life together. Mm -hmm. So that's the Kantian conception of the I, you mm -hmm. know, Wh whatever holds my mental life together, so that I don't suddenly, you know, that I'm not in uh, uh, being John Malkovich. Mm -hmm. So Kant Kant tries to argue that we're not in being John Malkovich. You know the movie you, where you can slip into John Malkovich's mind. So mm -hmm. it's not the case that suddenly it's not like I'm seeing you now, and then suddenly. Uh, I'm the king of the of the Netherlands, and I see my wife, and it comes into my mind, and then I'm back into this movie. It's like, oh my God, where does this, yeah. where does that come yeah. from? You know, yeah. like so the unity of my mental life. That's what Kant calls an mm -hmm. I, and uh, and I think that uh, well, there is a certain unity of my mental life, but there's much less unity of my mental life than I would think there is. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is the sense in which I might be almost a no self theorist, mm -hmm. uh, in that I do not believe that. Uh, that there's a uni or the unity of my mental life uh, that's, uh, you know, that's me, or whatever. But I, I, the, 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 this maybe, maybe this is a meta mm. question to yeah, this, but yeah. I'm, I'm wondering um, so if, I, if I really get your realism mm -hmm. right, uh, because, uh, mm. I mean, as you say, unicorns exist, uh, whatever exists. Uh, I would say the self also exists yeah. in the sense that it's a yeah. meaningful concept to me. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes you seem to be indeed like a phenomenologist who says yeah. everything that appears is just there and it has mm. equal rights. But on the other hand, there's also this side to your to yeah. your philosophy where you say no, no, no. But this is misleading yeah. concept. This yeah. is wrong, and you correct yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you correct how we yeah. employ language. Are these two potentially? Yeah, that's why I'm not a phenomenologist. Sides? Okay. Uh, that is exactly why I'm not a phenomenologist. Okay. I think that uh, um, I don't buy the mytholo methodology, if any. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are many phenomenologies. Uh, um, so uh, it's uh, um, you know asking uh, someone if he's a phenomenologist or what he think what they think about uh, phenomenology is like asking someone if they're an analytical philosopher. Mm -hmm. And then it depends on what you mean. If an analytical philosopher is someone who likes arguments, then I'm an analytic philosopher. If a phenomenologist is someone who likes the word appearance, then I'm a phenomenologist. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, if a phenomenologist is someone who believes that Husserl is right about anything, then I'm probably not a phenomenologist. Mm -hmm. if, you, uh, if a phenomenologist is someone who thinks that Heidegger is a philosopher, then I'm not sure if I'm a phenomenologist, and etc. So it depends a lot. I think you're uh, very sure. But yeah, I'm actually, yeah, 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 y
And 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 are we all talking about the same thing then? That that I think mm. is a related question. Oh yeah. Uh, th yeah. Th this is the Vesuvius, uh, uh, Vesuvius example yeah. with which you start again. Yeah. Because the physicist, in a, in a way, doesn't even speak about the moon. The moon doesn't exist. For yeah, me, it, yeah. it does exist. And if you're to then talking about the sun, I think, I mean, if the sun doesn't exist, why do I go on holiday in, yeah, in, in yeah. Italy? I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. But but yeah. but but but, but, but um, so so c can you actually speak about the, the um, identity yeah. here? Are, are we all speaking about the same thing here through these? Uh, different context through these different sinfeld. How how does your theory allow for that, or yeah. aren't we? Are, are, are this just are these different perspectives yeah. on the moon, yeah. or are this just different perspectives? But then, yeah, I, I where's the yeah, moon? Yeah, mm. I think it depends on the example. But f when it comes to the moon example, I would say it's all about the moon because mm -hmm. this is how, how we have been speaking. But mm -hmm. now the question is, how do I think about this? So mm -hmm. this is a question about aboutness, uh, uh, mm -hmm. intentionality. So yeah. how do I think about aboutness? And then I would say, well, uh, um, the qu uh, I'm an externalist here, mm -hmm. so I think that the the real question is, um, how does my how do my beliefs about certain gravitational forces that hold this object together, my beliefs about the history of the moon, my beliefs such as that uh, the Latin word luna is the uh, is, has the same meaning as the English word moon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, uh, how does all of this gravitate around? it, the moon. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, well, it does if there is the moon. Mm -hmm. And now you ask me, but what is the moon? And then I can say, well, and now I will, uh, I will always give you truth about the moon under some description. Mm -hmm. I will never give you a description-free encounter with the moon, mm -hmm. the naked moon. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, I, I would say there, there just is no naked moon, mm -hmm. which doesn't say that there are only appearances of it, but no it. I think, the, yeah. but this is the other... Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, the that other would be the worry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and also, I think this is the other enemy. You, you've talked yeah. about, you know, the Dick Swabs and naturalists, but yeah. there's one other, I think, enemy yeah. in the book, and these are what you call the con constructivists, yeah. uh, Kant, maybe yeah. to some mm. extent, because they they would make a distinction between what we make of the moon and the fact that we make exactly. this yeah. of the moon, yeah. the Ding yeah. and the Ding yeah. and sich. Wh yeah. Why is that? Why is this also an enemy for you? And and are they, are actually, yeah. is there a distinction between the two enemies also? Oh, no, that is a very good question, because on <laughs> some level they're really the same. Mm -hmm. uh, they paradoxically meet. I mean, Kant certainly, if you told him what a, natural is, a naturalist is, in my sense, would have said, I don't want to be one of those. Uh, but then he, of course, is one of those, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the naturalist would say, I don't want to be a constructivist, but then they wind up being constructivists, mm -hmm. often, you know, mm -hmm. on some level, maybe on all levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, so if I am my brain, then it's uh, then it's not very far. You know, the, the claim that I am my brain is uh, very close to the claim. They they don't coincide. They're logically independent. But mo many people hold both together. Uh, uh, so I am my brain, and I can never know how things really are because my brain constructs mental representations. I don't see you. Y uh, what I see is really in my visual cortex. So it's somewhere in V5 or wherever. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my visual field is not an o opening window onto you. You are really here. But then, of course, the question is, how did you get here? You're, you're too big in order. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. whatever. So uh, let's, uh, let's say yeah. that it's not confused. But yeah. you see, this is where the naturalists and the constructivists, they often meet. Yeah. Yeah. And they think they're re I, I do think that they are uh, two sides of the same coin, ultimately. Yeah, so it's uh, one enemy, actually. There's really one enemy. But the, uh, but the one enemy thinks uh, is, uh, it's a schizophrenic enemy. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, uh, um, for instance, I think Heidegger is a naturalist. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Uh, um, you would say, well, if anyone is not a naturalist, then Martin Heidegger. Yeah. On many readings that we are familiar with, mm -hmm. apart from the fact that, of course, he is a racist, if you just read his... Yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, um, evil but he, pony, maybe. Yeah, 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 evil pony, yeah. even. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 but he's a naturalist also. Uh, uh, if you look at what he actually says about nature, uh, he, he gives all of nature to physics. He's very happy with giving nature to physics. Uh, but then there's nature for Heidegger, nature, and that's mm. not nature. But nature, but what? That's a longer story. But uh, so uh, Heidegger is difficult to deal with. But uh, say, uh, uh, um, so what happened? I think in the constructivist camp, take Nietzsche. Nietzsche is, of course, in my sense, a prime <laughs> constructivist. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche is both a naturalist and a constructivist. Mm -hmm. So there, the idea is exactly. So there is this underlying reality that is absolutely non-constructed. Or take Dick Rorty, great example. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, he started off as uh, an eliminative materialist. Mm -hmm. That was one of his first papers that got him a job at Princeton, uh, mm -hmm. among other things, that he was an eliminative materialist. So someone who said there's only matter. 
And then Rorty said, okay, there's only matter, but then there's all this beautiful illusion, such as Proust literature. So he became, and Homer. So he became fascinated with the idea that even though uh, 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 our entire mental realm or the entire realm of subjectivity is a kind of illusion, probably constructed by our brain for survival interests or whatever, but we will never really figure this out because we are too stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, 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 therefore, m m uh, almost everything is constructed. Mm -hmm. And then if you go long enough this, down this road, you will start worrying about even your starting point that maybe undermine physics, turn it into just another form of language, game or art. Mm -hmm. But th those are related moves. Okay. And I think that they are related uh, uh, um, precisely because we think it's very hard for us to understand how there could be a world with spectators. So how I do this in the book is I draw a distinction between the idea of the world without spectators. That would be the naturalist. The naturalist says reality is the world without spectators. The constructivist says reality is the world of the spectators, no world behind it. So world without spectators versus world of spectators. And what I'm saying is, well, there are spectators and non-spectators. Mm -hmm. So I'm just combining the two. Perspectives mm -hmm. are also real. Mm -hmm. Okay. Causality, I think. Yeah, uh, causality I mean, is a... Uh, uh, how does causality work in your theory? <coughs> yeah, that's a big question. I mean, the, word, the, word, the, the yeah. example was colors. Yeah. I mean, yeah. colors... Yeah, yeah, let's do colors, yeah. I mean, colors are in the mind, but they're yeah. somehow caused by, you know, uh, light yeah. and being, you know, translated yeah. by our brain. Yeah. That's a causal story. How, yeah. do, how does it fit in your, yeah. your theory? Yeah, the question is how does... What is the mean... Uh, uh, so... Uh, um, what is the, 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 I would ask the following question. What is the meaning of green? So you can now say, so why do we usually want to say something like um, electromagnetic waves with a certain length and frequency, etc., okay, um, cause us to be in a certain state, to have a certain quale, the green impression, say, okay? So if that's the story, why do we want to tell the story? Because we learned, someone told us, metaphysics actually, early modern metaphysics, um, not Galileo, if you, but whatever, it doesn't matter who. But someone told us that um, the, uh, the word green doesn't really mean green. Green things are really electromagnetic waves with a certain etc. So we, re we think that the meaning of green is a particular meaning. We, mean, we think green means so-and-so nanometers, a, way, a, a certain kind of uh, radiation with, a certain, with certain properties. That's what green means. Now, that would not be a causal story. That would be a story about the meaning of the predicate green. And uh, 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 so the question is, how, how do we even get to a causal story? I think we only get to the plausibility of a causal story involving green being constructed by the brain because we assume that uh, our world, the right world picture, what would have been the case had we not been around, is a picture in which the word radiation applies, but the word green does not apply. So, uh, but first of all, if green means radiation, then the word, uh, of course, applies also if we are not around. So, uh, I don't, uh, so I don't think, for instance, I think it's, conf it's wrong to believe that, uh, well, take a green meadow, uh, that there really is not a green meadow there. So th what there really is is uh, elementary particles, say, or strings oscillating, whatever, f fill in the details with uh, actual physics, okay? And, and then the photons hit my nerve endings. I think that story is largely a, a, a metaphysical interpretation of, uh, on the basis of a bad semantics. That's what I think. So it's a confusion between giving an account of the meaning of the word green and explaining how we get into certain informational states. If you confuse the two questions, it might look as if there is only radiation there, and the radiation hits the eye, and then the green appears somewhere. And that is a mystery that neuroscience cannot solve, and every neuroscientist will tell you that they cannot solve this. So this is, uh, this is what, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is the explanatory gap. Uh, um, and, and there is an explanatory gap there, but I think the gap is, uh, is an artifact. Uh, you only think there's a gap because you think that there's only radiation out there, etc. So the gap is already the result of a confusion. What I think is that there's a green meadow and that I do see the green meadow. How do I see the green meadow? And then I fill in the story with the photons. So, uh, because I think, I personally think that the word green means uh, um, uh, radiation of a certain kind under certain uh, observer relative conditions. 
So uh, the, the, uh, the meaning of green, the meaning of the term involves both certain standard observers or, con or beliefs about what, certain, what standard observers are and radiation. The, they both go into the concept. So I don't think you can divide this up causally by saying nothing green out there, then cause a process and green pops up. Uh, uh, there is green without spectators because, uh, because uh, that's uh, the dispositional view of colors. So this would have been, this would have, it's an objective feature of the meadow that it would have looked green had someone with the, uh, had certain observers been around. It's a counterfactual property of the meadow. Okay. What's my account of causality in general? Well, uh, in general, I would say that uh, there is no general uh, question. So I don't think there's there's I don't think there's a big concept of causality which has something like the following form. Oh, causality is this: uh, if you have some time slice with uh, with an event E on it, and the event E consists of two states, S1 and S2. Uh, uh, then counterfactually, had S1 n not uh, 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 been part of that uh, event uh, slice, then S2 would not have happened or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that would be a very general uh, form, one form that your uh, theory of causality could take. And uh, then I would be probably happy with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you think that or some, something along the lines... So it's again one of these minimal concepts. Yeah, very minimal causality. Like truth, like... Yeah, li yeah like existence, like fact. That but causality is not push and pull. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when Hume said, I cannot see causality from looking at push and pull, he was perfectly right. Mm -hmm. But not because you can, uh, uh, he was per uh, but that does not mean there's no causality. It just means that causality is not push and pull. Mm -hmm. Causality is not this. <sighs> Mm -hmm. uh, 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 causality, uh, 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 that's, why, that's why we even have something like natural laws. Mm -hmm. Natural laws are always idealizations, you would say. I don't think they're idealizations, I think they're laws. But they're idealizations if we think that natural laws should describe this. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right, it's again a minimalist conception. Maybe one that's uh, confused. I currently, if you were to push me on the philosophy of science there, on the causality, I would try to go for such a counterfactual account of, uh, of the laws of nature. This is where I would try to go. The price to pay is that um, if a car hits another car, if there's a car accident, I would have to say that was not causal. Yeah. You know, yeah. things happened, but the word causality doesn't really apply there. I would, I would have to say something like that, which I'm giving you the costs of the view, but... Uh, yeah, yet to be worked out. Yeah, that's, that's really to be worked out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the colors, I have better beliefs. For the causality, I would, tr uh, given that uh, given that I have generally minimalist inclinations, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, this is the this is the the most minimalist concept that I'm acquainted with uh, in the philosophy of causality. Mm -hmm. Certainly not push and pull. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we have very little time left. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we okay. should combine the last two questions. Then I okay. have still few few follow up uh, questions. Yeah, I uh, imagine <laughs> 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 I'm probably afraid. about two hundred yeah, by now. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but maybe starting with the last one, yeah. uh, negative what, definition, the, the negative cool. definition, but also, ah. uh, so ah, you, that one. Okay. again, you're excluding the notion yeah. of world, we should yeah. no longer philosophically, meaningfully yeah. uh, use it. Um, but why, why yeah. can't you just say there is a field yeah. of sense, maybe let's yeah. call it metaphysics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and why doesn't it have a concept yeah. there? A yeah. Again, you're ruling yeah. something out. I am. And, yeah. and, and, and again, this is maybe yeah. again why you're not a phenomenologist. Uh, you're not just accepting yeah. things as they yeah. are. You say this is wrong and this is yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Can you yeah. say something about yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, uh, so let's see if this is the same kind of question, and I think it is. So mm -hmm. this, uh, the 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 most minimal version of the point. I'm acquainted with the point and many versions. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. Uh, of course, given my premises, you want to try this. Uh, um, so the most minimal version stems from John Searle. He says, "Well, look, the world exists in the following statement." The world is the world. Do you think that's false? <laughs> he asked me. You know, so if the world is the world is true, then something is true of the world. If the definition of object is that something is true of something, so the world is the world. Is that true or false? And then I said, it's meaningless. He's like, what do you mean? And here's what I mean. <laughs> uh, 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 um, um, the, uh, the, the, he really talks I, like that. By yeah, the yeah, way. I know. Yeah, yeah. If you know him. Uh, um, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I can, I'm only able to speak American English with, without an accent if I'm in full-blown John Searle mode. Yeah. Somehow he's my <laughs> model of English. 
I don't know what it's uh, for uh, you, yeah. yeah or, <laughs> or, uh, well, whatever. You know. uh, anyway, so uh, the world's the world. Um, and here I say, well, look, uh, the, there's an interesting observation by Bertrand Russell. He said that the round square is the round square, is, uh, is either false or meaningless. Why? Because in order for something to be identical, even with itself, it has to exist, mm -hmm. but the round square can't exist. So mm -hmm. the, wor the world is the world move, begs the question, because uh, 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 what uh, John Searles write in the following, the world is the world. I accept that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 but, uh, but if you disquote, if you take away the quotation marks, what I'm saying is that the, the following string of letters or the sound, uh, but if you take away the quotation mark, uh, I would say, well, but it means the, uh, uh, roughly the following. Mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. That's not a statement about the world. So, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and uh, here's another argument, which is similar. That's Paul Bogosian. So Paul said, uh, when he heard uh, an early version of this, he said, uh, well, look, that was his question. Um, doesn't the world exist in your thought mm -hmm. that it doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. So it exists in the thought. Yeah, uh, so it uh, exists. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so there it exists. And, and according to you, th thoughts do exist. Exactly, so therefore, hence, you know, yeah. like some, it looks like now the world exists. For instance, in the thought that denies its existence. Mm -hmm. Am I not looking at the world and now I'm putting a knot in front of it yeah. somehow? Uh, uh, and then it exists by my definition of existence. At least it has the existential status of, of unicorns. Mm -hmm. the, and that seems to be sufficient according to this ontology, right? Yeah. So uh, here, here the answer goes something like this. Well, that is not the world that you're looking for. That doesn't help the world friend. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, you can say something like that, but that doesn't help you. Why? Because imagine your idea is this. The world is there, and now you have a thought directed at the world, and that's the sense in which the world exists. It exists in the thought that uh, is directed at it. Now, question. Does the thought that is directed at the world exist in the world or not? And here you want to say yes, if the world means the all-encompassing. But then, the, uh, then you're missing your object. You think you're looking at the world. Mm -hmm. But the world is really the entity that is now that now consists of your thought and the world. So you would have to look sideways on. Mm -hmm. But now if you look sideways on, then there's another world, namely now consisting of the sideways on, little world and little thought. Mm -hmm. So there will be no position from which you can manage that thought. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, 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 you will never grasp the world, but only its uncanny doppelganger, as mm -hmm. I said in earlier work about mm -hmm. that. Uh, now I don't even think that you catch an uncanny doppelganger. You catch, mm -hmm. <coughs> but okay, that's. Uh, did, did, did you? Did, was this your argument against John Searle? And what did he say? That was my argument against Paul Bogosian, ah, which okay. he, he he found plausible. But ah. the heavier argument, which he found uh, utterly convincing, was Paul. You do know that this is what Hegel says. <laughs> 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 it's called absolute idealism. Yeah. Totality exists in the thought thinking totality. This is what Hegel calls the absolute idea. Mm -hmm. And that usually helps in America. If, if you prove that someone is a Hegelian... They don't want to be No, that. no, no. That's like... Yeah, that's yeah. like. But this entails the ontological argument. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 Another uh, evil German yeah, you don't want to be. Yeah, it's an evil German yeah. thing. Yeah. Hegel, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, um, but apart from that, uh, 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 I think I, uh, 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 when it comes to the world as the world, then uh, John Searle bought it. Uh -huh. He also uh, uh, um, uh, uh, gives a, regularly gives a paper with the following title why we live in one world at most. And he never said what he meant by at most. And I think that John really knows that there are paradoxes of this form, mm -hmm. uh, which is why he kind of wants to drop the world word. But he, has, uh, but he wants to have room for what you call the negative conception of the world. In an additive volume that just appeared with Surkamp in Germany called Der Neue, Ris Der Neue, Der Neue Realismus, The New Realism, it's about uh, uh, people who are thinking along the same lines. And Umberto Eco has a paper in that volume uh, who's also part of this discussion and uh, it's called Negative Realism. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and he defends that view. What he is saying is that, well, then by the world, let's just mean whatever resists. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, um, well, I'm happy with that. Uh, but if you believe, if you now unify that concept, then you will be prone to metaphysical illusions again. If you now think that everything which resists in that sense, mm -hmm. okay, which is, has this negative side, not me, okay, if world is not me, okay, uh, uh, then not me will not be unified. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a property of not you that it's not you. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Now that, that yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
No, uh, 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 I think it, I think it will get you into in the end. But I need, and the, but the arguments that I'm giving, that I have given, don't lead there. Okay, so I haven't shown this. This would be an independent discussion. But uh, uh, I think that you will wind, uh, you will, uh, you will come back to the position because in the end you will say something. Because in the end I will ask you something like this. Mm -hmm. But is there a domain in which your unified negative world and your thought about it are related? Mm -hmm. And now you better don't say no. Okay, mm -hmm. because otherwise uh, you are not related even to your negative world, not even negatively, as it were. Okay, mm -hmm. and then I would say, well, does that domain exist? And now you're back into my game because mm -hmm. now you have an all-encompassing domain consisting of you and not you. That's Fichte's problem. Remember, Fichte tried exactly that strategy. Uh, Fichte in 1794 tried the strategy that you call negative world against Kant. Fichte saw the same problem. He saw that world doesn't exist according to Kant. And Fichte said, okay, let's do it exactly like that. Let's say I and not I. The world then is not I and I am I. And then Fichte saw, but okay, but here's a problem. I and not I are part of a larger superstructure. And then Fichte said, okay, let's call the superstructure absolute I. And then, and then he went away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and he thought he could get away with this. And this woke Schelling. And Schelling said, Fichte, that doesn't work. And he, asked, he pointed out exactly that. And then Fichte, uh, Fichte revised his view famously, in particular in 1804, in his famous Wissenschaftsjahr 1804. He says, okay, here's the solution. I will not call it absolute I, because now I have two eyes and I see that I will call it being. <laughs> and then Schelling said, call it whatever you like, it's still incoherent. And then he died. Uh, <laughs> he tried a few other words, light, etc., yeah. but yeah. You know, he didn't solve the problem. Yeah. No. At, at, the end, at the end, I think we have to, yeah. uh, we have to stop. Uh, yeah. uh, actually, we should have stopped, but we still have a few minutes. Yeah. Um, I think I want to get back to the European Union. And, okay, that's um, good. Yeah. Uh, let's end there. And alle Menschen werden Brüder and mm -hmm. all of that. Um, and, and indeed, the, the question: wh What does your philosophy, if it if it's taught yeah. at the Grundschule all over Europe, yeah. what does it lead to? And then you came up with um, the answer: of value realism. Yeah. So uh, there are these European values, and they are real. They yeah. are they are there. Uh, that I think is very interesting. Mm. Uh, how do we get from the world does mm. not exist to this kind of belief in? Yeah. Absol absolute belief, yeah. I think, in, in, yeah, in re belief. really existing yeah. values. Can Definitely you, can absolute you, belief. Can, yeah. can you end with that, maybe? Yeah. So, uh, um, I, the, the, the world does not exist theory undermines a lot of the force of anti-realist arguments in the theory of values. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of the arguments, uh, you know, like, uh, here's something that many people take very seriously in ethics, or, or in meta-ethics, whatever... Uh, however you want to divide the field mm -hmm. up. But uh, many people in contemporary ethics take John Mackey very seriously. He wrote this famous book, uh, Ethics Invite, uh, Inventing Right and Wrong. And uh, Mackey said that uh, there cannot be any values because whatever there is is physical or natural. Values are not physical, they are prescriptive, so they can't exist. Yeah. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, I, I never found this convincing in the slightest, mm -hmm. But many people uh, have the impression that they have to respond to this. Yeah. This is really deep. Yeah. I think there's nothing deep about this, but many people have found this very deep. And it's driving a, a contemporary anti-realist account of values. You know, like if you look at Harvard constructivism in practical philosophy, Korsgaard and Schmorsgaard, what they believe is uh, uh, it, uh, it's full of, the Harvard is full of these people. And uh, the, uh, uh, they all have beliefs of that form, okay? So values can't be, they can't be out there, as they put it but we have to construct them so they're somehow made by us. And then there are all the moves. How do you then say they don't exist? So you have to come up with a theory of the existence of values that we have produced, but that nevertheless somehow exists. And then you get into really ontological trouble. And, but you only got there mm -hmm. because you were a believer in the world in the first place and you had a certain worldview. So once that worldview is gone, moral realism or value realism has a new chance. That is not yet a direct defense of it. You mm -hmm. need steps. But uh, there's nothing stands in your way of recognizing uh, uh, on the minimalist conception of value, truths, and knowledge mm -hmm. that I can know that it's evil to kill children. Mm -hmm. Nothing stands in my way of knowing this mm -hmm. if I'm done. Mm -hmm. That's not yet a justification for it. So you might, know, you might ask me, how do you know this? And then I would say, if you don't know that, you have a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. You don't have a cognitive problem then. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. means you're an evil person. Mm -hmm. So making a mistake in the moral realm 
doesn't, it's not an ordinary mistake. It turns you into an evil person. So Hitler was wrong in the moral realm. Mm -hmm. Turns out he's an evil person. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, so cognitive mistakes in the moral realm, uh, realm have a different shape. Mm -hmm. They have the shape of evil. Yeah. Uh, um, but now we, in, in, we think that we shouldn't use words like good and evil because we think it's somehow not tolerant. Mm -hmm. But I think that we only think that out of fear. We think that very dangerous people who we think are really evil could be more angry at us if we call them evil. Mm -hmm. So we pretend that we don't think they're evil. You know, uh, we're like, oh, you're not that evil. Mm -hmm. uh, because we want them not to be that evil. Mm -hmm. But they're exactly that evil. Uh, yeah. uh, fill it out. Uh, okay. The contemporary world has... Uh, Next year you're coming back and you're going to tell us how your book is going to convince the jihadi <laughs> uh, guy who goes to, 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 to Syria why he's wrong. Actually. Yeah, yeah. What he's looking for in Syria he can't find yeah. here. Yeah. That is, by the way, they're looking for the caliphate. Where was the caliphate? Well, in Spain. Yeah. It worked out quite yeah. nicely. Yeah. It, got us, it got us the renaissance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I love the caliphate. Caliphate's great. No, it's, it's one of the biggest achievements of humanity. Yeah. Uh, but the actual caliphate, great. The one, Love the caliph. Yeah, the uh, one that was already there. Yeah, the, the real caliphate there, yeah. was absolutely great. Amazing country. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. not kidding. It's a yeah. great empire. Yeah. Still was an empire. Yeah. Still had evil elements. Yeah. Uh, Maybe so we should stop here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Angela, you know what I mean. Yes. You know, so. <laughs> okay. uh, you already being watched by the Bundesverfassungsschutz. Anyway. I'm s no, yeah. I, but yeah, I, uh, I'm committed by being a German Beamter, f uh, yeah. uh, and I'm actually proud of it. Habermas calls this Verfassungspatriotismus. I think it's absurd we had this conversation, but yeah. I'm committed to, uh, uh, to what we call in Germany freiheitlich-demokratische Grundordnung. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and is this a problem? No, it's great! You know, so, uh, someone, I'm a representative of freedom and democracy. Great, wonderful. And now you can say, those are ideological constructions. Yeah, well, that's what you think. Mm -hmm. Live in China for a year and then come back and tell me freedom and democracy is only an ideological construction. No, you'll come back and it's like, finally you can breathe again. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> let's end here. Thank you very okay, much, good. Marcus.